Introduction of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. Demosthenes, the son of Demosthenes of Paeonia and Attica, a rich and highly respected factory owner, was born in or about the year 384 B.C. He was early left an orphan. His guardians mismanaged his property for their own advantage. And although soon after coming of age in 366, he took proceedings against them and was victorious in the law courts, he appears to have recovered comparatively little from them. In preparing for these proceedings, he had the assistance of Isaias, a teacher and writer of speeches who was remarkable for his knowledge of law. His complete mastery of all the aspects of any case with which he had to do, and his skill in dealing with questions of ownership and inheritance. Demosthenes' speeches against his guardians show plainly the influence of Isaias, and the teacher may have developed in his pupil the thoroughness and the ingenuity in handling legal arguments which afterwards became characteristic of his work. Apart from this litigation with his guardians, we know little of Demosthenes' youth and early manhood. Various stories have come down to us, for the most part not on the best authority, of his having been inspired to aim at an orator's career by the eloquence and fame of Callistratus, of his having overcome serious physical defects by assiduous practice, of his having failed nevertheless owning to imperfections of delivery, in his early appearances before the people, and having been enabled to remedy these by the instruction of the celebrated actor Satyrus, and of his close study of the history of Thucydides. Upon the latter point, the evidence of his early style leaves no room for doubt, and the same studies may have contributed to the skill and impressiveness with which in nearly every oration he appeals to the events of the past and sums up the lessons of history. Whether he came personally under the influence either of Plato the philosopher or of Isocrates, the greatest rhetorical teacher of his time and a political pamphleteer of high principles but little practical insight, is much more doubtful. The two men were almost as different in temperament and aims as it was possible to be. But Demosthenes' familiarity with the published speeches of Isocrates, and with the rhetorical principles which Isocrates taught and followed, can scarcely be questioned. In the early years of his manhood, Demosthenes undertook the composition of speeches for others who were engaged in litigation. This task required not only a very thorough knowledge of law, but the power of assuming, as it were, the character of each separate client, and writing in a tone appropriate to it, and, not less, the ability to interest and to rouse the active sympathy of juries, with whom feeling was perhaps as influential as legal justification. This part, however, of Demosthenes' career only concerns us here insofar as it was an admirable training for his later work. In the larger sphere of politics— in which the same qualities of adaptability and of power, both to argue cogently and to appeal to the emotions effectively, were required in an even higher degree. At the time when Demosthenes' interest in public affairs was beginning to take an active form, Athens was suffering from the recent loss of some of her most powerful allies. In the year 358 BC, she had counted within the sphere of her influence not only the islands of Lemnos, Imbros, and Skyros, which had been guaranteed to her by the Peace of Antalcidas in 387, but also the chief cities of Euboea, the islands of Chios, Kos, Rhodes, and Samos, Mytilene and Lesbos, the towns of Chersones, Byzantium, a city of the greatest commercial importance, and a number of stations on the south coast of Thrace, as well as Pydna, Potidia, Methoni, and the greater part of the country bordering upon the Thermaic Gulf. But her failure to observe the terms of alliance laid down when the new league was founded in 378 had led to a revolt, which ended in 355, 
or 354, in the loss to her of Chios, Codes, Rhodes, and Byzantium, and of some of the ablest of her own commanders, and left her treasury almost empty. About the same time, Mytilene and Corkira also took the opportunity to break with her. Moreover, her position in the Thermaic region was threatened first by Olynthus at the head of the Chaldisic League, which included over thirty towns, and secondly by Philip, the newly established king of Macedonia, who seemed likely to displace both Olynthus and Athens from their positions of commanding influence. Nevertheless, Athens, though unable to face a strong combination, was probably the most powerful single state in Greece. In her equipment and capacity for naval warfare, she had no rival, and certainly no other state could vie with her in commercial activity and prosperity. The power of Sparta and the Peloponnese had declined greatly. The establishment of Megalopolis as the center of a confederacy of Arcadian tribes, and of Messene as an independent city commanding a region once entirely subject to Sparta, had seriously weakened her position while at the same time her ambition to recover her supremacy kept alive a feeling of unrest throughout the Peloponnese. Of the other states of South Greece, Argo was hostile to Sparta, Elis to the Arcadians. Corinth and other less important cities were not definitely attached to any alliance, but were not powerful enough to carry out any serious movement alone. In North Greece, Thebes, though she lacked great leaders, was still a great power whose authority throughout Boeotia had been strengthened by the complete or partial annihilation of Platasia, Thespia, Orchomenus, and Corinia. In Athens, the ill-feeling against Thebes was strong, owing to the occupation by the Thebans of Oropus, a frontier town which Athens claimed, and their treatment of the towns just mentioned, towards which the Athenians were kindly disposed. The Phocians, who had until recently been unwilling allies of Thebes, were now hostile and not insignificant neighbors, and about this time entered into relations with both Sparta and Athens. The subject of contention was the possession or control of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi, which the Phoenicians had recently taken by force from the Delphians, who were supported by Thebes, and in the sacred war to which this act, which was considered to be sacrilege, gave rise in 355 B.C. The Thebans and Locrians fought against the Phocians in the name of the Amphictyonic Council, a body composed of representatives of tribes and states of very unequal importance, to which the control of the temple traditionally belonged. Thessaly appears to have been at this time more or less under Theban influence, but was immediately dominated by the tyrants of Phere though the several cities seem each to have possessed a nominally independent government. The Greek peoples were disunited, in fact, and unfitted for union by temperament. The twofold desire felt by almost all the more advanced Greek peoples for independence on the one hand, and for hegemony or leadership among the peoples on the other, rendered any effective combination impossible, and made the relations of states to one another uncertain and inconstant. While each people paid respect to the spirit of autonomy, when their autonomy was in question, they were ready to violate it without scruple when they saw their way to securing a predominant position among their neighbors. And although the ideal of Panhellenic unity had been put before Greece by Gorgias and Isocrates, its realization did not go further than the formation of leagues of an unstable character, each subject as a rule to the more or less tyrannical domination of some one member. Probably the power which was most generally feared in the Greek world was that of the king of Persia. Several times in recent years, and particularly in 387 and 367, he had been requested to make and enforce a general settlement of Hellenic affairs. The settlement of 387, called the king's peace or the peace of Antalcidas, after the Spartan officer who negotiated it, had ordained the independence of the Greek cities, small and great, with the exception of those in Asia Minor, which were to form part of the Persian Empire, and of Lemnos, Imbros, and Scrios, which were to belong to Athens as before. 
the attempt to give effect to the arrangement negotiated in 367 failed, and the terms of the Peace of Antalcidas, though it was still appealed to, when convenient, as a charter of liberty, also came to be disregarded. But there was also a sense of the possibility, or the danger, of provoking the great king to exert his strength, or at least to use his wealth, to the detriment of some or all of the Greek states, though at the moment of which we are speaking, about 355, the Persian Empire itself was suffering from recent disorders and revolutions, and the king had little leisure for interfering in the affairs of Greece. It was to the Department of Foreign and Interhellenic Affairs that Demosthenes principally devoted himself. His earliest political speeches, however, were composed and delivered in furtherance of prosecutions for the crime of proposing illegal legislation. These were the speeches against Androtian, spoken by Diodorus in 355, and against Leptinus in 354. Both these were written to denounce measures which Demosthenes regarded as dishonest or unworthy of Athenian traditions. In the former, he displays that desire for clean-handed administration, which is so prominent in some of his later speeches. And in the prosecution of Leptinus, he shows his anxiety that Athens should retain her reputation for good faith. Both speeches, like those of the year 352 against Timocrates, spoken by Diodorus, and against Aristocrates, spoken by Euthycles, are remarkable for thoroughness of argument and for the skill which is displayed in handling legal and political questions, though like almost all Athenian forensic orations, they are sometimes sophistical in argument. The first speech, which is directly devoted to questions of external policy, is that on the naval boards in 354, and this is followed, within the next two years, by speeches delivered in support of appeals made to Athens by the people of Megalopolis and by the exiled Democratic Party of Rhodes. From these speeches, it appears that the general lines of Demosthenes' policy were already determined. He was in opposition to Eubulus, who, after the disastrous termination of the war with the Allies, had become the leading statesman in Athens. The strength of Eubulus lay in his freedom from all illusion as to the position in which Athens stood in his ability as financier, and in his readiness to take any measures which would enable him to carry out his policy. He saw that the prime necessity of the moment was to recruit the financial and material strength of the city, that until this should be effected, she was quite incapable of carrying on war with any other power, and that she could only recover her strength through peace. In this policy, he had the support of the well-to-do classes who suffered heavily in time of war from taxation and the disturbance of trade. On the other hand, the sentiments of the masses were imperialistic and militant. We gather that there were plenty of orators who made a practice of appealing to the glorious traditions of the past, and the claim always made by Athens to leadership among the Greek states. To buy off the opposition, which his policy might be expected to encounter, Eubulus distributed funds freely to the people, in the shape of festival money, adopting the methods employed before him by demagogues, very different from himself, in order that he might override the real sentiments of the democracy. And in spite of the large amounts thus spent, he did in fact succeed in the course of a few years, in collecting a considerable sum without resorting to extraordinary taxation, in greatly increasing the navy, and enlarging the dockyards. For the success of this policy, it was absolutely necessary to avoid all entanglement in war, except under the strongest compulsion. The appeals of the Megalopolitans and the Rhodians to yield, to which would probably have meant war with Sparta and with Persia, must be rejected, even in dealing with Philip, who was making himself master of the Athenian allies on the Thermea coast. The fact of the weakness of Athens must be recognized, and all idea of a great expedition against Philip must be abandoned for the present. At the same time, some necessary measures of precaution were not neglected. It was essential to secure the route to the Euxine, over which the Athenian corn trade passed. 
if corn was not to be sold at famine prices. For this purpose, therefore, alliance was made with the Thracian prince, Cursobleptes, and when Philip threatened Harry and Tychos on the Propontis, an expedition was prepared, and was only abandoned because Philip himself was forced to desist from his attempt by illness. Similarly, when Philip appeared likely to cross the pass of Thermopylae in 352, an Athenian force was sent on the proposal of Diophantus, a supporter of Eubulus, to prevent him. The failure of Eubulus and his party to give effective aid to Olynthus against Philip was due to the more pressing necessity of attempting to recover control of Euboea, and it had clearly been their intention to save Olynthus, if possible. But when this had proved impossible, and the attempt to form a Hellenic League against Philip had also failed, facts had once more to be recognized, and since Athens was now virtually isolated, peace must be made with Philip on the only terms which he would accept, that each side should keep what it de facto possessed at the time. Demosthenes was generally in opposition to Eubulus and his party, of which Aeschines, once an actor and afterwards a clerk, but a man of education and great natural gifts, was one of the ablest members. Demosthenes was inspired by the traditions of the past, but had a much less vague conception of the moral to be drawn from them than had the multitude. Athens for him, as for them, was to be the first state in Hellas. She was above all to be the protectress of democracy everywhere, against both absolutism and oligarchy, and the leader of the Hellenists in resistance to foreign aggression. But unlike the multitude, Demosthenes saw that this policy required the greatest personal effort and readiness for sacrifice on the part of every individual, and he devotes his utmost energies to the task of arousing his countrymen to the necessary pitch of enthusiasm, and of effecting such reforms in administration and finance as, in his opinion, would make the realization of his ideal for Athens possible. In the speeches for the Megalopolitans and the Rhodians, the nature of this ideal is already becoming clear, both in its Athenian and in its Panhellenic aspects. But so soon as it appeared that Philip, at the head of the half-barbarian Macedonians, and not Athens, was likely to become the predominant power in the Hellenic world, it was against Philip that all his efforts were directed. And although in 346 he is practically at one with the party of Eubulus in his recognition of the necessity of peace, he is eager, when the opportunity seems once more to offer itself, to resume the conflict, and when it is resumed, to carry it through to the end. We have then before us the sharp antagonism of two types of statesmanship. The strength of the one lies in the recognition of actual facts and the avoidance of all projects which seem likely, under existing circumstances, to fail. The other is of a more sanguine type, and believes in the power of enthusiasm and self-sacrifice to transform the existing facts into something better, and to win success against all odds. Statesmen of the former type are always attacked as unpatriotic and mean-spirited, those of the latter as unpractical, and reckless. There is truth and falsehood in both accusations. But since no statesman has ever combined all the elements of statesmanship in a perfect and just proportion, and since neither prudence and clear-sightedness nor enthusiastic and generous sentiment can ever be dispensed within the conduct of affairs without loss, a larger view will attach little discredit to either type. While, therefore, we may view with regret some of the methods which both Demosthenes and Aeschines at times condescended to use in their conflicts with one another, and with no less regret the disastrous result of the policy which ultimately carried the day, we need not hesitate to give their due to both of the contending parties, nor, while we recognize that Eubulus and Phocion, his sturdiest supporter in the field and in council, took the true view of the situation, and of the character of the Athenians as they were, need we, as it is now fashionable to do, 
denounced the orator who strove with unstinting personal effort and self-sacrifice to rouse the Athenians into a mood in which they could and would realize the ideal to which they no less than he professed their devotion. But the difficulties in the way of such a realization were well-nigh insuperable. Neither the political nor the military system of Athens was adapted to such a policy. The sovereign assembly, though capable of sensible and energetic action at moments of special danger, was more likely to be moved by feeling and prejudice than by business-like argument, particularly at a time when the tendency of the best educated and most intelligent men was to withdraw from participation in public life. And meeting as the assembly did, unless specially summoned, only at stated intervals, it was incapable of taking such rapid, well-timed, and decisive action as Philip could take, simply because he was a single man, sole master of his own policy, and personally in command of his own forces. The publicity which necessarily attached to the discussion of the assembly was a disadvantage at a time when many plans would better have been kept secret and rapid modifications of policy to suit sudden changes in the situation were almost impossible. Again, while no subjects are so unsuited under any circumstances for popular discussion as foreign and military affairs, the absence in Athens of a responsible ministry greatly increased the difficulties of her position. It is true that the controller of the festival fund, whose office gradually became more and more important, was now appointed for four years at a time, while all other offices were annual, and that he and his friends and their regular opponents were generally ready to take the lead in making proposals to the council or the assembly. But if they chose to remain silent, they could do so. No one was bound to make any proposal at all, and on the other hand, anyone might do so. With such a want of system, far too much was left to chance or to the designs of interested persons. Moreover, the assembly felt itself under no obligation to follow for any length of time any lead which might be given to it, or to maintain any continuity or consistency between its own decrees. In modern times, a minister brought into power by the will of the majority of the people can reckon for a considerable period upon the more or less loyal support of the majority for himself and his official colleagues. In Athens, the leader of the moment had to be perpetually adapting himself afresh to the mood of the assembly, and even to deceive it, in order that he might lead it all, or carry out the policy which, in his opinion, his country's need required. It is therefore a remarkable thing that both Eubulus and Demosthenes succeeded for many years in maintaining a line of action as consistent as that taken by practical men can ever be. The fact that the Council of 500, which acted as a standing committee of the people and prepared business for the Assembly and was responsible for the details of measures passed by the Assembly in general form, was chosen by lot and changed annually, as did practically all the civil and the military officials, though the latter might be re-elected, was all against efficiency and continuity of policy. After the system of election by lot, the most characteristic feature of the Athenian democracy was the responsibility of statesmen and generals to the law courts. Any citizen might accuse them upon charges nominally limited in scope, but often serving in reality to bring their whole career into question. Had it been certain that the courts would only punish incompetence or misconduct, and not failure as such, little harm would have resulted. But although there were very many acquittals and political trials, the uncertainty of the issue was so great, and the sentences inflicted upon the condemned so severe, commonly involving banishment at least, that the liability to trial as a criminal must often have deterred the statesman and the general from taking the most necessary risks, while the condemnation of the accused had usually the result of driving a really able man out of the country, and depriving his fellow countrymen of services which might be urgently required when they were no longer available. 
The financial system was also ill-adapted for the purposes of a people constantly liable to war. The funds required for the bare needs of a time of peace seem indeed to have been sufficiently provided from permanent sources of income, such as the silver mines, the rent of public lands, court fees and fines, and various indirect taxes, but those needed for war had to be met by a direct tax upon property, levied ad hoc whenever the necessity arose, and not collected without delays and difficulties. And although the equipment of ships for service was systematically managed under the triarchic laws, it was still subject to delays no less serious. There was no regular system of contribution to state funds, and no systematic accumulation of a reserve to meet military needs. The raising of money by means of loans at interest to the state was only adopted in Greece in a few isolated instances, and the practice of annually distributing surplus funds to the people, however necessary or excusable under the circumstances, was wholly contrary to sound finance. An even greater evil was the dependence of the city upon mercenary forces and generals, whose allegiance was often at the call of the highest bidder, and in consequence was seldom reliable. There is no demand which Demosthenes makes with greater insistence than the demand that the citizens themselves shall serve with the army. At a moment of supreme danger they might do so. But in fact, Athens had become more and more an industrial state, and men were not willing to leave their business to take care of itself for considerable periods in order to go out and fight, unless the danger was very urgent, or the interests at stake of vital importance. Particularly now, that the length of campaigns had become greater and the seasons exempted from military operations shorter. In many minds, the spreads of culture and the ideal of self-culture had produced a type of individualism indifferent to public concerns and contemptuous of political and military ambitions. Moreover, the methods of warfare had undergone great improvement. In most branches of the army, the trained skill of the professional soldier was really necessary, and it was not possible to leave the olive yard or the counting house and become an efficient fighter without more ado. But the expensiveness of the mercenary forces, the violent methods by which they obtained supplies from friends and neutrals, as well as foes, if as often happened, their pay was in arrear, and the dependence of the city upon the good will of generals and soldiers, who could without much difficulty find employment under other masters, were evils which were bound to hamper any attempt to give effect to a well-planned and far-sighted scheme of action. It also resulted from the Athenian system of government that the general, while obviously better informed of the facts of the military situation than anyone else could be, and at the same time always liable to be brought to trial in case of failure, had little influence upon policy, unless he could find an effective speaker to represent him. In the assembly, and in the law courts, where the juries were large enough to be treated in the same manner as the assembly itself, the orator who could win the people's ear was all-powerful, and expert knowledge can only make itself felt through the medium of oratory. A constitution which gave so much power to the orator had grave disadvantages. The temptation to work upon the feelings rather than to appeal to the reason of the audience was very strong, and no charge is more commonly made by one orator against another than that of deceiving or attempting to deceive the people. It is indeed very difficult to judge how far an Athenian assembly was really taken in by sophistical or dishonest arguments, but it is quite certain that such arguments were continually addressed to it, and the main body of citizens can scarcely have had that first-hand knowledge of facts which would enable them to criticize the orator's statements. Again, the oration appealed to the people as a performance, no less than a piece of reasoning. Ancient political oratory resembled the oratory of the pulpit at the present day, not only because it appealed perpetually to the moral sense, and was in fact a kind of preaching, but also because the main difficulty of the ancient orator and the modern preacher was the same, for the Athenians liked being preached at as the modern congregation enjoys a good sermon, and were therefore almost equally immune against conversion. The conflicts of rival orators were regarded mainly as entertainment. The speaker, who was most likely to carry the voting, 
except when a great crisis had roused the assembly to seriousness, was the one who found specious and apparently moral reasons for doing what would give the audience least trouble, and consequently one who, like Demosthenes, desired to stir them up to action and to personal sacrifices, had always an uphill fight. And if he also at times deceived the people, or employed sophistical arguments in order to secure results which he believed to be for their good, we must remember the difficulty, which, in spite of the wide circulation of authentic information, is at least equally great at the present day, of putting the true reasons for or against the policy before those who, whether from want of education or from lack of training and the subordination of feeling to thought, are not likely to understand or to listen to them. Nor, if we grant the genuineness of Demosthenes' conviction as to the desirability of the end for which he contended, can many statesmen be pointed out who have not been at least as guilty as he in their choice of means. That he did not solve the problem, how to lead a democracy by wholly honest means, is the less to his discredit, and that the problem still remains unsolved. It should be added that with an audience like the Athenian, whose aesthetic sensitiveness was doubtless far greater than that of any modern assembly, delivery counted for much. Eschines's fine voice was a real danger to Demosthenes, and Demosthenes himself spoke of delivery, or the skilled acting of his part, as the all-important condition of an orator's success. But it is clear that this can have been no advantage from the standpoint of the public interest. In the law courts, the drawbacks to which the commanding influence of oratory was liable were intensified. In the assembly, a certain amount of reticence and self-restraint was imposed by custom. An opponent could not be attacked by name or on purely personal grounds, and an appearance of impartiality was commonly assumed. But in the courts, much greater play was allowed to feeling, and the arguments were often much more disingenuous not only because the personal interests at stake made the speaker more unscrupulous, but also because the injuries ordinarily included a larger proportion of the poorer, the idler, and the less educated citizens than the assembly. The legal question was often that to which the jury were encouraged to pay least attention, and the condemnation or acquittal of the accused was demanded upon grounds quite extraneous to the indictment. The two court speeches contained in these volumes afford abundant illustration of this. Personalities were freely admitted, of a kind which it is difficult to excuse and impossible to justify. To attempt to blacken the personal character of an opponent by false stories about his parentage and his youth, and by the ascription to him and his relations of nameless immoralities, is a very different thing from the assignment of wrong motives for his political actions, though even in purely political controversy, the ancients far exceeded the utmost limits of modern invective. And this both Demosthenes and Eschines do freely. There is also reason to suspect that some of the tables which each tells of the other's conduct, both while serving as ambassadors and on other occasions, may be fabrications. The descriptive passages for which such falsehoods gave an opening had doubtless their dramatic value in the oratorical performance. Possibly they were even expected by the listeners. But their presence in the speeches does not increase our admiration either for the speaker or for his audience. All the force of Demosthenes' oratory was unable to defeat the great antagonist of his country. To Philip of Macedon, Failure was an inconceivable idea. Resident during these impressionable years of his youth at Thebes, he had there learned from the example of Epaminondas what a single man could do, and he proceeded to each of the three great tasks of his life. The welding of the rough Macedonians into one great engine of war, the unification of Greece under his own leadership, and the preparation for the conquest of the East by a united Greece and Macedonia, without either faltering in face of difficulties, or hesitating out of any scrupulosity to use the most effective means toward the end which he wished at the moment to achieve, though in fact the charges of bad faith made against him by Demosthenes are found to be exaggerated when they are impartially examined. 
Philip intended to become a master of Greece. Demosthenes realized this early, and with all the Hellenic destination of a master, resolved to oppose him to the end. Philip was indeed, in spite of the barbarous traits which revealed themselves in him at times, not only gracious and courteous by nature, but a sincere admirer of Hellenic, in other words, of Athenian culture. The relations between his house and the people of Athens had generally been friendly, and there was little reason to suppose that if he conquered Athens, he would treat her less handsomely than, in fact, he did. Yet this could not justify one who regarded freedom as Demosthenes regarded it, in making any concession not extorted by the necessities of the situation. His duty and his country's duty, as he conceived it, was to defeat the enemy of Hellenic independence, or to fall in the attempt. Nor was it for him to consider, as Isocrates might, whether or not Philip's plans had now developed into, or could be transformed into, a beneficent scheme for the conquest of the barbarian world by a united Hellas, if the union was to be achieved at the price of Athenian liberty. It is because, in spite of errors, and of the questionable methods to which he sometimes stooped, Demosthenes devoted himself unflinchingly to the cause of freedom, for Athens, and for the Hellenes as a whole, that he is entitled, not merely as an orator, but as a politician, to the admiration which posterity has generally accorded him. It is above all by the second part of his career, when his policy of antagonism to Philip had been accepted by the people, and he was no longer in opposition, but as it were in office, that Demosthenes himself claims to be justified, and Ascini's attempt to invalidate the claim is for the most part unconvincing. It is not easy to describe in a few paragraphs the characteristics of Demosthenes as an orator. That he stands on the highest eminence that an orator has ever reached is generally admitted, but this is not to say that he was wholly free from faults. His contemporaries, as well as later Greek critics, were conscious of a certain artificiality in his eloquence. It was indeed the general custom of Athenian orators to prepare their speeches with great care. The speakers who, like Ascanes and Demades, who were able to produce a great effect without preparation, and the rhetoricians who, like Alcidamus, thought of the studied oration as but a pure imitation of true eloquence, were only a small minority. And in general, not only was the arrangement of topics carefully planned, but the greatest attention was paid to the sound and rhythm of the sentences and to the appropriateness and order of the words. The orator had also his collection of passages on themes which were likely to recur constantly, and of arguments on either side of many questions. And from these he selected such passages as he required, and adapted them to his particular purpose. The rhetorical teachers appear to have supplied their pupils with such collections, we find a number of the instances of the repetition of the same passage in different speeches, and an abundance of arguments formed exactly on the model of the precepts contained in rhetorical handbooks. Yet with all this art, nothing was more necessary than that a speech should appear to be spontaneous and innocent of guile. There was a general mistrust of the clever speaker who by study or rhetorical training had learned the art of arguing to any point and making the worse cause appear the better. To have studied his part too carefully, even to have worked up illustrations from history and poetry, might expose the orator to suspicion. Demosthenes, in spite of his frequent attempts to deprecate such suspicion, did not succeed wholly in keeping on the safe side. Ascanes describes him as a wizard and a sophist who enjoyed deceiving the people or the jury. Another of his opponents leveled at him the taunt that his speeches smelt of the lamp. Dionysius of Halicarnassus, one of the best of the ancient critics, said that the artificiality of Demosthenes and his master Isaias was apt to excite suspicion, even when they had a good case. Nor can a modern reader altogether escape the same impression. Sometimes, especially in the earlier speeches to the assembly, the argument seems unreal. 
the joints between the previously prepared commonplaces or illustrations and their application to the matter in hand are too visible. The language is artificially phrased and wanting in spontaneity and ease. There are also parts of the court speeches in which the orator seems to have calculated out all the possible methods of meeting a particular case, and to be applying them in turn with more ingenuity than convincingness. An appearance of unreality also arises at times, again principally in the earlier speeches, from a certain want of imagination. He attributes feelings and motives to others, which they were really most unlikely to have entertained, and argues from them. Some of the sentiments which he expects Artaxerxes or Artemisia to feel, in the speeches on the naval boards and for the Rhodians, were certainly not to be looked for in them. Similar misconceptions of the actual or possible sentiments of the Spartans appear in the speech for the Megalopolitans, and of those of the Thebans in the Third Olynthiac. The early orations against Philip also show some misunderstanding of his character, and if in fact Demosthenes lived his early years largely in solitary studiousness and was unsociable by disposition, this lack of a quick grasp of human nature and motives is quite intelligible. But this defect grew less conspicuous as his experience increased, and though even to the end there remained something of the sophist about him, as about all the disciples of the ancient rhetoric, the greatness of his best work is not seriously affected by this. For in his greatest speeches, and in the greatest parts of nearly all his speeches, the orator is white-hot, with genuine passion and earnestness. And all his study and preparation resulted for the most part not in an artificial product, but in the most convincing expression of his real feeling and belief, so that it was the man himself, and not the rhetorical practitioner that spoke. The lighter virtues of the orator are not to be sought for in him. In gracefulness and humor, he is deficient. His humor, indeed, generally takes the grim forms of irony and satire, or verges on personality and bad taste. Few of his sentences can be imagined to have been delivered with a smile, and something like ferocity is generally not far below the surface. Pathos is seldom in him, unmixed with sterner qualities, and is usually lost in indignation. But of almost every other variety of tone, he has a complete command. The essential parts of his reasoning even when it is logically or morally defective, are couched as a rule in a forcible and cogent form, and he has a striking power of close, sustained, and at the same time lucid argumentation. His matter is commonly disposed with such skill that each topic occurs where it will tell most powerfully, and while one portion of a speech affords relief to another, where relief is needed, and particularly in the longer orations, all alike bear on the main issue or strengthen the orator's position with his audience. Historical allusions are not, as they often are by Askenines and Isocrates, enlarged out of proportion to their importance, but are limited to what is necessary, in order to illustrate the orator's point or drive his lesson home. And to these qualities his combination of political idealism with absolute mastery of minute detail the intensity of his appeal to the moral sense and patriotism of his hearers, the impressiveness of his denunciation of political wrong, the vividness of his narrative, the rapid succession of his impassioned phrases, and some part of the secret of his power will be explained. For the rest, while there is in his writing every degree of fullness or brevity, there is no waste of words, no fine language out of place. His language, indeed, is ordinarily simple, sometimes even colloquial, though in the arrangement of his words, in their most telling order, he shows consummate art, and his metaphors are often bold and sometimes even violent. In the use of the figures of speech, he excels, above all, in the use of antitheses, whether for the purpose of vivid contrast or of precise logical expression, and of the rhetorical question used now in indignation, now in irony, 
now in triumphant conclusion of an argument, and at times there are master strokes of genius, which defy all analysis, such as the great appeal to the men of Marathon in the speech of the Crown. He does not, as a rule, and this is particularly true of the speech of the Crown, cover the whole of the ground with the same adequacy, but so concentrates all his forces upon certain points as to be irresistible, and thus with thunder and lightning confounds the orators who oppose him. It is no wonder that some of the greatest of English orators, and notably of those of the 18th and early 19th centuries, borrow from him, not only words and phrases, but inspiration and confidence in their cause, and look upon him as a model whom they may emulate, but cannot excel. End of introduction. Section 1 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Naval Boards. Introduction. The speech was delivered in 354 B.C. News had been brought to Athens that the Persian king, Artaxerxes Ochus, was making great military and naval preparations, and though these were, in fact, directed against his own rebellious subjects in Egypt, Phoenicia, and Cyprus, the Athenians had some ground for alarm. For, two years before this, Carus, in command of an Athenian fleet, had given assistance to Artabazus, satrap of Ionia, who was in revolt against the king. The king had made a protest, and, late in 355, Athens had ordered Carus to withdraw his aid from Artabazus. A party in Athens now wished to declare war on Persia, and appealed strongly to Athenian traditions in favor of the proposal. Demosthenes opposes them, on the ground that it is not certain that the king was aiming at Athens at all, and that the disunion of the Hellenic peoples would render any such action unsafe. Athens had more dangerous enemies near her home, and her finances were not in a condition for such a campaign. But he takes advantage of the interest aroused to propose a reform of the triarchic system, designed to secure a more efficient navy, and to remedy certain abuses in the existing method of equipping vessels for service. In earlier times, the duty of equipping and commanding each trireme was laid upon single citizens of means, the hull and certain fittings being found by the state. When, early in the 4th century, the number of wealthy men had diminished, each ship might be shared by two citizens, who commanded in turn. In 357, a law was passed on the proposal of Periander, transferring the responsibility from individuals to simmeries or boards. The system had been instituted in a slightly different form for the collection of the war tax in the archonship of Nausinicus, 378-377 to BC. The collection of the sums required became the work of 20 boards, formed by the subdivision of the 1,200 richest citizens. Each contributor, whatever his property, paid the same share. The richer men thus got off with the loss of a very small proportion of their income, as compared with the poorer members of the boards, and in managing the business of the boards they sometimes contrived to exact the whole sum from their colleagues, and to escape payment themselves. At the same time, the duties of the several boards and their members were not allocated with sufficient precision to enable the responsibility to be brought home in the case of default, and the nominal 1200 had fallen to a much smaller number, on whom the burden accordingly fell with undue weight. Demosthenes' proposal provided for the distribution of the responsibility of equipping the vessels and providing the funds in the most detailed manner, with a view to preventing all evasion, but it was not carried. In fact, it was not until 340 that he succeeded in reforming the triarchy, and he then made the burden vary strictly with property. The proposal, however, to declare war upon Persia went no further. While in his speech Demosthenes is in accord with the policy of Eubulus so far as the concerns the avoidance of war with Persia, his proposals of financial reform would not be viewed with favor by the wealthy men who were Eubulus's firm supporters. Some of the themes which occur continually in later speeches are prominent in this, the futility of rhetorical appeals to past glories without readiness for personal service, and the need of a thorough organization of the forces. While the speech shows rather too strongly the marks of careful preparation, and seldom rises to eloquence, the style, indeed, is often rather cramped and stiff, and the sentiments, especially at the beginning, artificially phrased. It is moderate and practical in tone, and shows a characteristic mastery of minute detail.
Those who praise your forefathers, men of Athens, desire, no doubt, to gratify you by their speeches. And yet I do not think that they are acting in the interests of those whom they praise. For the subject on which they attempt to speak is one to which no words can do justice. And so, although they thus win for themselves the reputation of capable speakers, the impression which they convey to their hearers of the merit of our forefathers is not adequate to our conception of it. For my part, I believe that their highest praise is constituted by time. For the time that has passed has been long, and still no generation has arisen whose achievements can be compared with advantage to theirs. As for myself, I shall attempt to point out the way in which, in my opinion, you can best make your preparations. For the truth is that if all of us who propose to address you were to succeed in proving to you our rhetorical skill, there would not be the slightest improvement in your condition. I am sure of it. But if a single speaker were to come forward, whoever he might be, who could instruct and convince you as to the nature of the preparations which should meet the city's need, as to their extent, and the resources upon which we can draw for them, your present fears would be instantly dissolved. This I will attempt to do, if indeed it is in my power. But first, I must briefly express my views as to our relations with the king. I hold the king to be the common enemy of all the Hellenes, and yet I should not on that account urge you, alone and unsupported, to raise war against him. For I observe that there is no common or mutual friendship even among the Hellenes themselves, some have more faith in the king than in some other Hellenes. When such are the conditions your interest requires you, I believe, to see to it that you only begin war from a fair and just cause, and to make all proper preparations, this should be the basis of your policy. For I believe, men of Athens, that if it were made plain to the eyes and understandings of the Hellenes that the king was making an attempt upon them, they would both fight in alliance with those who undertook the defense for them and with them, and would feel very grateful to them. But if we quarrel with them prematurely, while his intentions are still uncertain, I am afraid, men of Athens, that we may be forced to fight not only against the king, but also against those for whose benefit we are exercising such forethought. For he will pause in the execution of his project, if indeed he really has resolved to attack the Hellenes, and will bribe some of them with money and offers of friendship, while they, desirous of bringing their private wars to a successful end, and animated only by such a spirit, will disregard the common safety of all. I urge you, then, not to hurl the city needlessly into the midst of any such chaos of selfish passions. Moreover, I see that the question of the policy to be adopted towards the king does not even stand on the same footing for the other Hellenes as for you. It is open, I think, to many of them to manage certain of their own interests as they please, and to disregard the rest of the Hellenes. But for you it is not honorable, even if you are the injured party, and are dealing with those who have injured you, to punish them so severely as to leave some of them to fall under the domination of a foreigner. And this being so, we must take care. First, that we do not find ourselves involved in an unequal war. And secondly, that he, whom we believe to be plotting against the Hellenes, does not gain credit from the supposition that he is their friend. How then can this be achieved? It will be achieved if it is manifest to all that the forces of Athens have been overhauled and put into readiness and if her intentions in regard to their use are plainly righteous. But to those who take a bold line, and urge you, without any hesitation whatever, to go to war, my reply is this, that it is not difficult to win a reputation for bravery when the occasion calls for deliberation, nor to prove yourself an accomplished orator when danger is at the door. But to display your courage in the hour of danger, and in debate to have wiser advice to offer than others, that is the hard thing and that is what is required of you. For my part, men of Athens, I consider that the proposed war with the king would be a difficult undertaking for the city, while the decisive conflict in which the war would result would be an easier matter, and for this reason. Every war, I suppose, necessarily requires ships and money and the command of positions. All such advantages the king, I find, possesses more abundantly than we. But a conflict of forces requires nothing so much as brave men, and of these, I believe, the larger number is with us and with those who share our danger. For this reason, I exhort you not to be the first, in any way whatever, to take up the war. But for the decisive struggle, I think you ought to be ready, and your preparations made. And further, if the forces with which foreigners and Hellenes could respectively be repelled were really different in kind, the fact that they were arraying our forces against the king would naturally, it may be, admit of no concealment. But since all military preparations are of the same character, and the main points of a force must always be the same, the means to repel enemies, to help allies, 
and to retain existing advantages, why, when we have our acknowledged foes, do we seek to procure others? Let us rather prepare ourselves to meet the enemies whom we have, and we shall then repel the king also, if he takes the aggressive against us. Suppose that you yourselves summon the Hellenes to your side now, if, when the attitude of some of them towards you is so disagreeable, you do not fulfill their demands, how can you expect that any one of them will listen to you? Why, you say? We shall tell them that the king is plotting against them. Good heavens! Do you imagine that they do not foresee this themselves? Of course they do. But their fear of this does not yet outweigh the quarrels which some of them have against you and against each other, and so the tour of your envoys will end in nothing but their own rhapsodies. But if you wait then, if the design which we now suspect is really on foot, there is not one of the Hellenes who stands so much upon his dignity that he will not come and beg for your aid, when he sees that you have a thousand cavalry, and infantry as many as one can desire, and three hundred ships, for he will know that in these lies his surest hope of deliverance. Appeal to them now, and we shall be suppliants, and, if unsuccessful, rejected suppliants. Make your own preparations and wait, and then they will be the suppliants, and we their deliverers, and we may rest assured that they will all come to us for help. In thinking out these points and others like them, men of Athens, my object was not to devise a bold speech, belonged to no purpose, but I took the greatest pains to discover the means by which our preparations could be most effectively and quickly made. And therefore, if my proposal meets with your approval, when you have heard it, you ought, I think, to pass it. Now, the first element in our preparation, men of Athens, and it is the most important, must be this. Your minds must be so disposed that every one of you will perform willingly and heartily any service that is required of him. For you see, men of Athens, that whenever you have unanimously desired any object, and the desire has been followed by a feeling on the part of every individual, that the practical steps towards it were for himself to take, the object has never yet slipped from your grasp. But whenever the wish has had no further result, and that each man has looked to his neighbor, expecting his neighbor to act while he himself does nothing, the object has never been yet attained. But supposing you to be filled with the keenness that I have described, I am of opinion that we should make up the twelve hundred to their full number, and increase it to two thousand by the addition of eight hundred. For if you can display this total, then, when you have allowed for the unmarried heiresses and orphans, for the property outside Attica, or held in partnership, and for any persons who may be unable to contribute, you will, I believe, actually have the full twelve hundred persons available. These you must divide into twenty boards, as at present, with sixty persons to each board, and each of these boards you must divide into five sections of twelve persons each, taking care in every case to associate with the richest man the poorest men, to maintain the balance. Such is the arrangement of persons which I recommend, and my reason you will know when you have heard the nature of the entire system. I pass to the distribution of ships. You must provide a total complement of three hundred ships, forming twenty divisions of fifteen ships apiece and including in each division five of the first hundred vessels, five of the second hundred, and five of the third hundred. Next, you must assign by lot to each board of persons its fifteen ships, and each board must assign three ships to each of its sections. This done, in order that you may have the payments also systematically arranged, you must divide the six thousand talents, for that is the taxable capital of the country, into one hundred parts of sixty talents each, Five of each of these parts you must allot to each of the larger boards, the twenty, and each board must assign one of these sums of sixty talents to each of its sections, in order that, if you need one hundred ships, there may be sixty talents to be taxed for the expense of each ship, and twelve persons responsible for it. If two hundred, thirty talents will be taxed to make up the cost, and six persons will be responsible. If three hundred, then twenty talents must be taxed to defray the expense, and four persons will be responsible. In the same way, men of Athens, I bid you make a valuation according to the register of all those fittings of the ships which are in arrear, divide them into twenty parts, and to allot to each of the large boards one twentieth of the debtors. These must then be assigned by each board in equal numbers to each of its sections, and the twelve persons composing each section must call upon their share of the arrears, and provide, ready equipped, the ships which fall to them. Such is the plan by which, in my opinion, the expense, the ships, the triarchs, and the recovery of the fittings could best be provided for and put into working order. I proceed to describe a simple and easy scheme for the manning of the vessels. I recommend that the general should divide the whole space of the dockyards into ten, 
taking care to have in each space 30 slips for single vessels close together. This done, they should apportion to each space two of the boards and 30 ships, and should then assign a tribe to each space by lot. Each captain should divide into three parts the space which falls to his tribe, with the corresponding ships, and should allot these among the three wards of each tribe, in such a way that if each tribe has one division of the entire docks, each ward will have a third of one of these divisions. And you will know, in case of need, first the position assigned to the tribe, next that of the ward, and the names of the triarchs and their ships. Each tribe will be answerable for thirty, and each ward for ten ships. If the system is put in train, circumstances as they arise will provide for anything that I may have overlooked today, for perhaps it is difficult to think of everything, and there will be a single organization for the whole fleet and every part of it. But what of funds? What resources have we immediately at our command? The statement which I am about to make on this subject will no doubt be astonishing, but I will make it nevertheless, for I am convinced that upon a correct view of the facts, this statement alone will be proved true, and we will be justified by the event. I say, then, that this is not the time to discuss the financial question. We have large resources upon which, in case of necessity, we may honorably and rightly draw. But if we inquire for them now, we shall not believe that we can rely upon them, even against the hour of need. So far shall we be from supplying them now. What then, you will ask me, are these resources, which are non-existent now, but will be ours then? This is really like a riddle. I will tell you. Men of Athens, you see all this great city. In this city there is wealth which will compare, I had almost said, with the united wealth of all other cities, but such is the disposition of those who own it, that if all your raiders were to raise the alarm that the king was coming, that he was at your doors, and that there was no possible escape, and if with the raiders an equal number of prophets foretold the same thing, even then, far from contributing funds, they would show no sign, and make no acknowledgment, of their possession of them. If, however, they were to see in course of actual realization all the terrors with which at present we are only threatened in speeches, not one of them is so blind that he would not both offer his contribution and be among the first to pay the tax. For who will prefer to lose his life and property rather than contribute a part of his substance to save himself and the remainder of it? Funds, then, we can command, I am certain, if there is a genuine need of them, and not before. And accordingly, I urge you not even to look for them now. For all that you would provide now, if you decided upon a levy, would be more ludicrous than nothing at all. Suppose we are told to pay 1% now. That gives you 60 talents. 2% then. Double the amount. That makes 120 talents. And what is that to the 1,200 camels which, as these gentlemen tell us, are bringing the king's money for him? Or would you have me assume a payment of one twelfth, five hundred talents? Why, you would never submit to this, and if you paid the money down, it would not be adequate to the war. You must, therefore, make all your other preparations, but allow your funds to remain for the present in the hands of their owners. They could nowhere be more safely kept for the use of the state. And then, if ever the threatened crisis arises, you will receive them as the voluntary gift of their possessors. This, men of Athens, is not only a possible course of action, but a dignified and politic one. It is a course of action which is worthy to be reported to the ears of the king, and which would inspire him with no slight apprehension. For he well knows that by two hundred ships, of which one hundred were Athenian, his ancestors were deprived of one thousand. And he will hear that Athens alone has now equipped three hundred, so that, however great his infatuation, he could certainly not imagine it a light thing to make this country his foe. But if it is his wealth that suggests proud thoughts to his mind, he will find that in this respect, too, his resources are weaker than ours. It is true that he is said to be bringing a great quantity of gold with him. But if he distributes this, he must look for more. For just so it is the way of springs and wells to give out, if large quantities are drawn from them all at once. Whereas we possess, as you will hear, in the taxable capital of the country, resources which we defend against attack in a way of which those ancestors of his who sleep at Marathon can best tell him. And so long as we are the masters of this country, there is no risk of our resources being exhausted. Nor again can I see any grounds for the fear which some feel lest his wealth should enable him to collect a large mercenary force. It may be that many of the Hellenes would be glad to serve under him against Egypt, against Orontes, or against certain other foreign powers, not from which the king should conquer any such enemies, but because each desires individually to obtain some private means to relieve his present poverty. But I cannot believe that any Hellene would march against Hellas, whither he will turn afterwards, 
Will he go to Phrygia and be a slave? For the war with the foreigner is a war for no other stake than our country, our life, our habits, our freedom, and all that we value. Where is the wretch who would sacrifice self, parents, sepulchres, fatherland, for the sake of some short-lived gain? I do not believe that he exists. And indeed, it is not even to the king's own interest to conquer the Hellenes with a mercenary force, for an army which has conquered us is, even more certainly, stronger than he. And his intention is not to destroy us, only that he may fall into the power of others. He wishes to rule, if it may be, over all the world. But if not, at least over those who are already his slaves. It may be supposed that the Thebans will be on the king's side. Now this subject is one upon which it is hard to address you. For such is your hatred of them, that you cannot hear a good word about them, however true, without displeasure. And yet those who have grave questions to consider must not on any pretext pass over any profitable line of argument. I believe, then, that so far are the Thebans from being likely ever to march with him against the Hellenes, that they would give a great deal, if they had it to give, for an opportunity of cancelling their former sins against Hellas. But if anyone does believe that the Thebans are so unhappily constituted, at least you are all aware, I presume, that if the Thebans take the part of the king, their enemies must necessarily take the part of the Hellenes. My own belief is that our cause, the cause of justice, and its supporters, will prove stronger in every emergency than the traitor and the foreigner. And therefore, I say that we need feel no excessive apprehension, and that we must not be led on into taking the first step towards war. Indeed, I cannot even see that any of the other Hellenes has reason to dread this war. Are they not all aware that so long as they thought of the king as their common foe, and were at unity with one another, they were secure in their prosperity, but that ever since they imagined that they could count upon the king as their friend, and fell to quarreling over their private interests, they have suffered such evils as no malediction could have devised for them? Must we then dread a man whose friendship, thanks to fortune in heaven, has proved so unprofitable, and his enmity so advantageous? By no means. Let us not, however, commit any aggression in view of our own interests, and of the disturbed and mistrustful spirit which prevails among the rest of the Hellenes. Were it possible, indeed, to join forces with them all, and with one accord to attack the king in his isolation, I should have counted it no wrong even were we to take the aggressive. But since this is impossible, we must be careful to give the king no pretext for trying to enforce the claims of the other Hellenes against us. If you keep the peace, any such step on his part would arouse suspicion. But if you were the first to begin the war, his hostility to you would make his desire to befriend your rivals appear natural enough. Do not then lay bare the evil condition of Hellas by calling the powers together when they will not obey, or undertaking a war which you will be unable to carry on. Keep the peace. Take courage, and make your preparations. Resolve that the news which the king hears of you shall certainly not be that all Hellas, and Athens with it, in distress, or panic, or confusion. Far from it. Let him rather know that if falsehood and perjury were not as disgraceful in Hellenic eyes as they are honorable in his, you would long ago have been on the march against him. And that though, as it is, your regard for yourselves forbids you to act thus, you are praying to all the gods that the same madness may seize him as once seized his ancestors. And if it occurs to him to reflect upon this, he will find that your deliberations are not conducted in any careless spirit. He at least shares the knowledge that it was your wars with his own ancestors that raised Athens to the summit of prosperity and greatness. While the peaceful policy which she previously pursued never gave her such a superiority as she now enjoys over any single state in Hellas. Aye, and he sees that the Hellenes are in need of one who, whether intentionally or not, will reconcile them to one another, and he knows that if he were to stir up war, he himself would assume that character in relation to them, so that the news which he will hear of you will be intelligible and credible to him. But I do not wish to trouble you, men of Athens, by unduly prolonging my speech. I will therefore recapitulate my advice and retire. I bid you prepare your forces with a view to the enemies whom you have. If the king or any other power attempts to do you injury, you must defend yourselves with these same forces. But you must not take the aggressive by word or deed, and you must take care that it is your deeds and not your platform speeches that are worthy of your forefathers. If you act thus, you will be consulting your own interests and those of the speakers who are opposing me, since you will have no cause to be angry with them afterwards, because you have decided wrongly today. End of section 1. Recorded by Roger Serling.
Section 2 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. For the Megalopolitans, Oration 16. Introduction. In 371 BC, the Thebans, under Epaminondas, defeated the Spartans at Leuctra and, assisted by Thebes, the Arcadians and Messenians threw off the Spartan yoke. The former founded Megalopolis as their common center, the latter Messene. But after the death of Epaminondas in 362, Thebes was left without a leader, and when, in 355, she became involved in the sacred war with the Phocians, the new Peloponnesian states turned towards Athens, and Messene received a solemn promise of Athenian assistance, if ever she was attacked by Sparta. In 353, Thebes was suffering considerably from the sacred war, and the Spartans made an ingenious attempt to recover their power in the form of a proposal for the restoration of territory to its original owners. This meant that Athens would recover Oropus, which had been in the hands of Thebes since 366 and had previously been the subject of a long-standing dispute. That Orchomenus, Thespia, and Plataea which had all been overthrown by Thebes, would be restored, and that Alice and Phleas would also recover certain lost possessions. All these states would then be morally bound, so the Spartans thought, to help Sparta to reconquer Arcadia and Messenia. On the occasion of this speech, delivered in 353, the Megalopolitans had appealed to Athens, and an Arcadian and a Spartan embassy had each had an audience of the assembly, and had each received strong support from Athenian speakers. The principal motives of the supporters of Sparta were their hostility to Thebes and their desire not to break with the Spartans, whom Athens had assisted at Mantinea in 362 against the Thebans and Megalopolitans. Demosthenes supports the Arcadians and lays great stress on the desirability of maintaining a balance of power between Sparta and Thebes so that neither might become too strong. To allow Sparta to reconquer Arcadia and, as the next step, Messenia, would be to render her too formidable, and to reject the proposal of Sparta would not preclude Athens from recovering Oropus and demanding the restoration of the Boeotian towns. But the promise of assistance to the Arcadians should be accompanied by a request for the termination of their alliance with Thebes. Demosthenes' advice was not followed. In fact, Athens was hardly in a position to risk becoming entangled in a war with Sparta, particularly in view of the danger to her northern possessions from Philip. She therefore remained neutral, while the Thebans, relieved from the pressure of the sacred war owing to the defeat of the Phocian leader, Onomarchus, by Philip, were able to send aid to Megalopolis. A truce between Sparta and Megalopolis was made about 350. It was, however, a result of the neutrality of Athens that she was unable, a few years later, to secure the support of the Arcadians against Philip, whose allies they subsequently became. Lord Broom describes the oration as one of extraordinary subtlety and address in handling delicate topics, and, after quoting the passage in which Demosthenes urges the necessity of maintaining a balance of power between rival states, adds that this is precisely the language of modern policy. At the same time, the speech has, in places, a somewhat academic and theoretical air. It is much occupied with the weighing of hypothetical considerations and obligations against one another, and though it enunciates some plain and reasonable political principles, and makes an honest attempt to satisfy those who wished to help the Arcadians, but at the same time desired to regain ground against Thebes, it is not always convincing, and the tone is more frankly opportunist than is usually the case with Demosthenes. End of introduction. I think, men of Athens, that those who have spoken on the Arcadian side and those who have spoken on the Spartan are alike making a mistake. For their mutual accusations and their attacks upon one another would suggest that they are not, like yourselves, Athenians, receiving the two embassies, but actually delegates of the two states. 
such a tax it was for the two deputations to make. The duty of those who claimed to advise you here was to discuss the situation impartially and to inquire in an uncontentious spirit what course is best in your interests. As it is, if one could alter the fact that they are known to us and that they speak the dialect of Attica, I believe that many would imagine that those on the one side actually were Arcadians and those on the other Spartans. For my part, I see plainly enough the difficulty of offering the best advice. For you, like them, are deluded in your desire for one extreme or the other, and the one who endeavors to propose an intermediate course, which you will not have the patience to understand, will satisfy neither side and will forfeit the confidence of both. But in spite of this, I shall prefer, for my own part, to risk being regarded as an idle chatterer, if such is really to be my lot, rather than to abandon my conviction as to what is best for Athens and leave you to the mercy of those who would deceive you. And while I shall deal with all other points later, by your leave, I shall take for my starting point, in explaining the course which I believe to be best, those principles which are admitted by all. There can be no possible question that it is to the interest of the city that both the Spartans and these Thebans should be weak, and the present situation, if one may judge at all from what has constantly been asserted in your presence, is such that, if Orchomenus, Thespia, and Plataea are re-established, Thebes becomes weak, and that if the Spartans can reduce Arcadia to subjection and destroy Megalopolis, Sparta will recover her former strength. We must, therefore, take care not to allow the Spartans to attain a formidable degree of strength before the Thebians have become insignificant, lest there should take place, unobserved by us, such an increase in the power of Sparta as would be out of proportion to the decrease in the power of Thebes, which our interests demand. For it is, of course, out of the question that we should desire merely to substitute the rivalry of Sparta for that of Thebes, that is not the object upon which we are bent. Our object is rather that neither people shall be capable of doing us any injury. That is what will best enable us to live in security. But, granted that this is what ought to be, still we are told it is a scandalous thing to choose for our allies the men against whom we were arrayed at Mantinea, and further, to help them against those whose perils we shared that day. I agree, but I think that we need to insert the condition, provided that the two parties are willing to act rightly. For if all alike prove willing to keep the peace, we shall not go to the aid of the megalopolitans, since there will be no need to do so, and so there will be no hostility whatever on our part towards our former comrades in battle. They are already our allies, as they tell us, and now the Arcadians will become our allies as well. What more could we desire? but suppose they act wrongfully and think fit to make war. In that case, if the question before us is whether we are to abandon Megalopolis to Sparta or not, then I say that, wrong though it is, I will acquiesce in our permitting this and declining to oppose our former companions in danger. But if you all know that, after capturing Megalopolis, they will march against Messene, let me ask any of those who are now so harshly disposed towards Megalopolis to say what action he will then advise. No answer will be given. In fact, you all know that, whether they advise it or not, we must then go to the rescue, both because of the oath which we have sworn to the Messenians, and because our interests demand the continued existence of that city. Ask yourselves then, on which occasion you can most honorably and generously interpose to check the aggressions of Sparta in defense of Megalopolis, or in defense of Messene. On the present occasion, it will be understood that you are succoring the Arcadians, and are anxious that the peace which you fought for and risked your lives to win may be secure. But if you wait, all the world will see, plainly, that it is not in the name of right that you desire the existence of Messene, but because you are afraid of Sparta. And while we should always seek and do the right— we should at the same time take good care that what is right shall also be advantageous. Now an argument is used by speakers on the other side to the effect that we ought to attempt to recover Oropus, 
and that if we make enemies of those who might come to our assistance against it, we shall have no allies. I too say that we should try to recover Oropus, but the argument that the Spartans will be our enemies now if we make alliance with those Arcadians who desire our friendship is an argument which no one has less right even to mention than those who induced you to help the Spartans when they were in danger. Such was not their argument when all the Peloponnesians came to you, entreating you to support them in their campaign against Sparta, and they persuaded you to reject the entreaty, with the result that the Peloponnesians took the only remaining course and applied to Thebes, when they bade you contribute funds and imperil your lives for the deliverance of the Spartans. Nor, I presume, would you have been willing to protect them had they warned you that you must expect no gratitude for their deliverance, unless, after saving them, you allowed them once more to do as they pleased and commit fresh aggressions. And further, however antagonistic it may be to the designs of the Spartans that we should make the Arcadians our allies, they are surely bound to feel a gratitude towards us for saving them when they were in the utmost extremity, which will outweigh their vexation at our preventing their present wrongdoing. Must they not then either assist us to recover Oropus, or else be regarded as the basest of mankind? For, by heaven, I can see no other alternative. I am astonished also to hear it argued that if we make the Arcadians our allies and carry out my advice, it will seem as though Athens were changing her policy and were utterly unreliable. I believe that the exact reverse of this is the case, men of Athens, and I will tell you why. I suppose that no one in the world can deny that when this city saved the Spartans, and before them the Thebans, and finally the Eubians, and subsequently made them her allies, she had one and the same end always in view. And what was this? It was to deliver the victims of aggression. And if this is so, it is not we that should be changing, but those who refuse to adhere to the right, and it will be manifest that, although circumstances change from time to time with the ambitious designs of others, Athens does not change. I believe that the Spartans are playing a very unscrupulous part. At present, they tell us that the Eleans are to recover part of Triphylia, and the Phliasians Tricarinum. Other Arcadians are to recover their own possessions, and we ourselves are to recover Oropus. Not that they have any desire to see every state enjoying its own. Far from it, such generosity on their part would be late indeed in showing itself. They wish rather to present the appearance of cooperating with each separate state in the recovery of the territory that it claims, in order that, when they themselves march against Messene, all may take the field with them, and give them their hearty assistance, on pain of seeming to act unfairly, in refusing to return, an equivalent for the support which each of them received from Sparta, in regard to their own several claims. My own view is, that even without the tacit surrender of some of the Arcadians to Sparta, we can recover Oropus, aided not only by the Spartans, if they are ready to act honorably, but by all who disapprove of allowing Thebes to retain what is not her own. But even if it were made quite plain to us that without allowing Sparta to subdue the Peloponnese, we should not be able to take Oropus, I should still think it preferable, if I may dare to say so, to let Oropus go, rather than sacrifice Messene and the Peloponnese to Sparta. For our quarrel with them would not, I believe, be confined to this since, I will not say what occurs to me, but there are many risks which we should run. But, to pass on, it is a monstrous thing to use the hostile actions which, they say, the megalopolitans committed against us under the influence of Thebes as a ground of accusation against them today. And, when they wish to be friends, and so atone for their action by doing us good, to look askance at them, to seek for some way of avoiding their friendship, to refuse to recognize that, in proportion to the zeal which my opponents can prove the megalopolitans to have shown in supporting Thebes, will be the resentment to which my opponents themselves will deservedly be exposed, for depriving the city of such allies as these, when they have appealed to you 
before appealing to Thebes. Such a policy is surely the policy of men who wish to make the Arcadians for the second time the allies of others. And so far as one can forecast the future by calculation, I am sure, and I believe that most of you will agree with me, that if the Spartans take Megalopolis, Messene will be in peril. And if they take Messene also, then I predict that we shall find ourselves allies of Thebes. It is a far more honorable, a far better course, that we should ourselves take over the Theban confederacy, refusing to leave the field open to the cupidity of the Spartans, than that we should be so afraid of protecting the allies of Thebes as first to sacrifice them, and then to save Thebes itself, and in addition, to be in a state of apprehension for our own safety. For if the Spartans capture Megalopolis and become a great power once more, the prospect, as I conceive it, is not one which the city can view without alarm. For I can see that even now they are determining to go to war, not to prevent any evil which threatens them, but to recover their own ancient power, and what their aims were when they possessed that power you, I think, know perhaps better than I, and with that knowledge may well be alarmed." Now, I should be glad if the speakers, who profess their hatred for Thebes on the one side, or for Sparta on the other, would tell me, if their professed hatred is based on consideration for you and your interests, or whether the one party hates Thebes from an interest in Sparta, and the other Sparta from an interest in Thebes. If the latter is the case, you should not listen to either, but treat them as insane, but if the former, why this inordinate exaltation of one side or the other? For it is possible, perfectly possible, to humiliate Thebes without rendering Sparta powerful. Indeed, it is by far the easier course, and I will try to tell you how it can be done. We all know that, however unwilling men may be to do what is right, yet up to a certain point they are ashamed not to do so, and that they withstand wrongdoers openly, particularly if there are any who receive damage through the wrong done. And we shall find that what ruins everything, and is the source of all evil, is the unwillingness to do what is right, without reserve. Now, in order that no such obstacle may stand in the way of the humiliation of Thebes, let us demand the re-establishment of Thespia, Orchomenus, and Plataea, cooperating with their citizens ourselves and requiring others to do so for the principle of refusing to allow ancient cities to lie desolate is a right and honorable one but let us at the same time decline to abandon megalopolis and messene to the aggressors or to suffer the destruction of existing and inhabited cities on the pretext of restoring plataea and thespia then if our policy is made plain to all, there is no one who will not wish to terminate the Thebans' occupation of territory not their own. But if it is not, not only will our designs be opposed by the Arcadians in the belief that the restoration of these towns carries with it their own ruin, but we shall have troubles without end. For honestly, where can we expect to reach an end? when we permit the annihilation of existing cities and require the restoration of those that have been annihilated. It is demanded by those whose speeches display the strongest appearance of fairness that the megalopolitans shall take down the pillars which commemorate their alliance with Thebes if they are to be trustworthy allies of Athens. The megalopolitans reply that for them it is not pillars but interest that creates friendship, and that it is those who help them that they consider to be their allies. Well, that may be their attitude. Nevertheless, my own view is, roughly speaking, this. I say that we should simultaneously require the megalopolitans to take down the pillars, and the Spartans to keep the peace, and that, in the event of either side refusing to fulfill our request, we should at once take the part of those who are willing to fulfill it. 
For if the Megalopolitans obtain peace, and yet adhere to the Theban alliance, it will be clear to all that they prefer the grasping policy of Thebes to that which is right. If, on the other hand, Megalopolis makes alliance frankly with us, and the Spartans then refuse to keep the peace, it will surely be clear to all that what the Spartans desire so eagerly is not the re-establishment of Thespia, but an opportunity of subduing the Peloponnese while the Thebans are involved in the war. And I am surprised to find that there are some who are alarmed at the prospect of the enemies of Sparta becoming allies of Thebes, and yet see nothing to fear in the subjection of these enemies by Sparta herself, whereas the experience of the past can teach us that the Thebans always used such allies against Sparta, while when Sparta had them, she used to use them against us. There is another point which I think you should consider. Suppose that you reject the overtures of the Megalopolitans. If they are annihilated and dispersed, Sparta can recover her power at once. If they actually survive, for things have happened before now beyond all hope, they will quite rightly be the firm allies of Thebes. But suppose you receive them. Then the immediate result, so far as they are concerned, is that they are saved by you. And as to the future, let us now transfer our calculation of possible risks to the case of the Thebans and Spartans. If the Thebans are crushed, as they ought to be, the Spartans will not be unduly powerful, for they will always have these Arcadians at their doors to hold them in check. But if the Thebans actually recover and survive the attack, they will at least be weaker, for the Arcadians will have become our allies and will owe their preservation to us. Thus, on every ground, it is to our interest not to sacrifice the Arcadians, nor to let them think that their deliverance, if they are really saved, is due to themselves or to any other people than you. And now, men of Athens, I solemnly declare that what I have said has been prompted by no personal feeling, friendly or hostile, towards either side. I have told you only what I believe to be expedient for you, and I exhort you not to sacrifice the people of Megalopolis, and to make it your rule never to sacrifice a smaller power to a greater. End of section 2. Read by Maria James, The Glorious Midwest USA, November 2020. Section 3 of The Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sabrina Jazz Ainsworth. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. For the Freedom of the Rhodians, or Number 15. Introduction. Dionysius of Halicarnassus places the speech in 351 BC. He is not always accurate, and the internal evidence has been thought by some to suggest a date perhaps two years earlier. The reasons, however, for this are not strong, and there has recently been a disposition to accept Dionysius's date. As the result of the social war, Chios, Kos, Rhodes, and Byzantium had made themselves independent of Athens. They had been assisted by Mausolus, king of Caria and vassal of Persia. After the termination of the war, a Carian garrison occupied Kos and Rhodes. The democratic constitution of Rhodes was overthrown and the Democratic Party driven into banishment as the result of an oligarchic plot which Mausolus had fostered. In 353, Mausolus died and was succeeded by Artemisia, his sister and wife. The exiles appealed to Athens for restoration and for the liberation of Rhodes from the Carian domination. It is evident that the feeling in Athens against the Rhodians was very strong, owing to their part in the late war, for which the Democratic Party had been responsible, and there was some fear for the possible consequences of offending Artemisia, and perhaps becoming involved in a war with Persia. Demosthenes, nevertheless, urges the people to assist them and to forget their misconduct. He appeals to the traditional policy of Athens as the saviour of the oppressed 
and protectress of democracies, and warns them of the danger which would threaten Athens herself if the conversation of free constitutions into oligarchies were allowed to go unchecked. He takes a different view from that of his opponents of the probable attitude of Artemisia, and utters an impressive warning against corrupt and unpatriotic statesmen, which foreshadows his more vehement attacks in the orations against Philip. The appeal was unsuccessful, for in the speech on the peace, see section 25, Demosthenes speaks of Kos and Rhodes as still subject to carrier. The speech is more eloquent than the last and more outspoken. Political principles and ideals are enunciated with some confidence and illustrated by striking examples from history. But there also appears for the first time that sense of the difficulty of rousing the Athenians to action of any kind, which is so strongly expressed in later speeches. End of introduction. It is, I think, your duty, men of Athens, when you are deliberating upon affairs of such importance, to grant freedom of speech to every one of your advisers. And for my part, I have never yet felt any difficulty in pointing out to you the best course, for I believe that, broadly speaking, you all know from the first what this is. My difficulty is to persuade you to act upon your knowledge, for when a measure is approved and passed by you, it is as far from execution as it was before you resolved upon it. Well, you have to render thanks to heaven for this, among other favours, that those who went to war with you not long ago, moved by their own insolent pride, now place their own hopes of preservation in you alone. Well may we rejoice at our present opportunity, for if your decision in regard to it is what it should be, you will find yourselves meeting the calumnies of those who are slandering this city with a practical and a glorious reputation. For the peoples of Chios, Byzantium and Rhodes accused us of entertaining designs against them, and on this ground they combined against us in the recent war. But now it will be seen that while Mausolus, who under the pretense of friendship towards Rhodes, directed and instigated their efforts, in reality robbed the Rhodians of their freedom, while the declared allies, Chaos and Byzantium, never came to aid them in their misfortunes. You, of whom they were afraid, and you alone, have been the authors of their salvation. And because all the world will have seen this, you will cause the popular party in every city to consider your friendship a guarantee of their own safety. Nor could you reap any greater blessing than the goodwill which will thus be offered to you, spontaneously and without misgivings upon every hand. I noticed to my surprise that those who urge us to oppose the king in the interest of the Egyptians are the very persons who are so afraid of him when it is the interest of the popular party in Rhodes that is in question. And yet it is known to everyone that the Rhodians are Hellenes, while the Egyptians have a place assigned them in the Persian Empire. I expect that some of you remember that when you were discussing our relations with the king, I came forward and was the first to advise you, though I had, I believe, no supporters, or one at the most, that you should show your good sense, in my opinion, if you did not make your hostility to the king the pretext of your preparations, but prepared yourselves against the enemies whom you already had, though you would resist him also if he attempted to do you any injury. Nor when I spoke thus did I fail to convince you, but you also approved of this policy. What I have now to say is the sequel to my argument on that occasion. For if the king were to call me to his side and make me his counsellor, I should give him the same advice as I gave you, namely, that he should fight in defence of his own possessions, if he were opposed to any Hellenic power, but should absolutely forego all claim to what in no way belongs to him. If, therefore, you have made a general resolve, men of Athens, to retire from any place of which the king makes himself master, either by surprise or by the deception of some of the inhabitants, you have not resolved well in my judgment. But if you are prepared, in defence of your rights, even to fight if need be, and to endure anything that may be necessary, not only will the need for such a step be less, the more firmly your minds are made up, but you will also be regarded as showing the spirit which you ought to show. To prove to you that I am not suggesting anything unprecedented in bidding you liberate the Rhodians, and that you will not be acting without precedent, if you take my advice I will remind you of one of those instances in the past which have ended happily for you. You once sent out Timotheus, men of Athens, to assist Ariobazanes, adding to your resolution the provision that he must not break our treaty with the king. And Timotheus, seeing that Ariobazanes was now openly in revolt against the king, but that Samos was occupied by a garrison under Cyprothemis, who had been placed there by Tigranes, the king's viceroy, abandoned his intention of helping Ariobazanes, but sat down before Samos, relieved it, and set it free. And to this day, no war has ever arisen to trouble you on account of this. For to enter upon a war for the purpose of aggrandizement is never the same thing as to do so in defence of one's own possessions. Everyone fights his hardest to recover what he has lost, but when men endeavour to gain at the expense of others, it is not so. They desire to do this if it is allowed to them, but if they are prevented, they do not consider that their opponents have done them any wrong. Now listen for a moment, and consider whether I am right or wrong, when I conclude that, 
If Athens were actively at work, Artemisia herself would now not even oppose our action. If the king effects in Egypt all that he is bent upon, I believe that Artemisia would make every attempt to secure for him the continued possession of Rhodes, not from any good will towards him, but from the desire to be credited with a great service to him while he is still in her neighbourhood, and so to win from him as friendly a reception as possible. But if he is faring as we are told, if all his attempts have failed, she will consider, and rightly, that the island can be of no further use to the king, except as a fortified post to command her own dominions, a security against any movement on her part. Accordingly, she would prefer, I believe, that you should have it without her openly surrendering it to you, rather than that he should occupy it. I think, therefore, that she would not even make an attempt to save it, or that, if she actually did so, it would be but weakly and ineffectively. For although I cannot, of course, profess to know what the king would do, I must insist that it is high time that it should be made clear, in the interests of Athens, whether he intends to lay claim to Rhodes or not, for if he does so, we have then to take counsel, not for the Rhodians alone, but for ourselves and for the Hellenes as a whole. At the same time, even if the Rhodians, who are now in possession of the town, held it by their own strength, I should never have urged you to take them for your allies, for all the promises in the world. For I observed that they took to their side some of their fellow citizens, to help them overthrow the democracy, and that, having done this, they turned and expelled them. And I do not think that men who failed to keep faith with either party would ever be trustworthy allies for yourselves. And further, I should never have made my present proposal had I been thinking only of the interests of the popular party in Rhodes. I am not their official patron, nor have I a single personal friend among them, and even if both these things were otherwise, I should not have made this proposal had I not believed it to be for your advantage. For, as for the Rhodians, if I may use such an expression when I am pleading with you to save them, I share your joy at what has happened to them. For it is because they grudged you the recovery of your rights that they have lost their own freedom, and that, instead of the equal alliance which they might have had with the Hellenes, better than themselves, they are in bondage to foreigners and slaves whom they have admitted to their citadels. Indeed, if you resolve to go to their aid, I may almost say that this calamity has been good for them, for, Rhodians as they are, I doubt if they would ever have come to their right mind in prosperity, whereas actual experience has now taught them that folly generally leads to manifold adversities, and perhaps they will be wiser for the future. This lesson, I feel sure, will be no small advantage to them. I say, then, that you should endeavour to save these men, and should bear no malice, remembering that you too have been greatly deceived by conspirators against you, and yet would not admit that you deserved yourselves to suffer for such mistakes. Observe this also, men of Athens. You have waged many wars, both against democracies and against oligarchies, and of this no doubt you are as well aware as I. But I doubt whether any of you considers for what objects you are fighting in each case. What then are these objects? In fighting against a democracy, you are fighting either over some private quarrel, when the parties have failed to settle their disputes by the means publicly provided, or you are contending for a piece of territory, or about a boundary, or for a point of honour, or for paramountcy. But in fighting against an oligarchy, it is not for any such objects. It is your constitution and your freedom that are at stake. And therefore I should not hesitate to say that I believe it would be better for you that all the Hellenic peoples should be democracies, and be at war with you, than that they should be governed by oligarchies and be your friends. For with a free people, you would have no difficulty, I believe, in making peace whenever you desired. But with an oligarchical state, friendship itself cannot be safe. For there can be no good will between few and many, between those who seek for mastery and those who have chosen the life of political equality. It surprises me also that though Chios and Mytilene are ruled by oligarchies, and though now the Rhodians and all mankind, I may almost say, are being brought into the same bondage, no one considers that any danger threatens our own constitution also or reflects that if every state is organised upon an oligarchic basis, it is not possible that your own democracy should be suffered to remain. For they know that no people but you could ever bring them forth into a state of liberty again, and they will wish to put an end to so likely a source of trouble to themselves. As a rule, we may regard wrongdoers as enemies only to those whom they have wronged. But when men destroy free constitutions and convert them into oligarchies, I say that you must think of them as the common enemies of all whose hearts are set on freedom. Again, men of Athens, it is only right that you, a democracy yourselves, should show towards other democracies in distress the same spirit as you would expect them to show towards you, if any such calamity, which God forbid, should happen to you. It may be said that the Rhodians are justly punished. If so, this is not the time to exult over them. When men are prosperous, they should always be found taking thought how best to help the distressed, for the future is unknown to all men. I have often heard it stated here in your presence, that when our democracy had met with disaster, 
you were joined by certain others in your anxiety for its preservation. Of these, I will only refer on the present occasion to the Argives, and that briefly. For I cannot desire that you, who enjoy the reputation of being always the saviours of the distressed, should prove inferior to the Argives in that work. These Argives, though their territory borders on that of the Spartans, whom they saw to be masters by land and sea, neither hesitated nor feared to display their goodwill towards you. But when envoys came from Sparta, so the story goes, to demand the persons of certain Athenian refugees, they even voted that unless the envoys departed before sunset, they should be adjudged public enemies. If then the democracy of Argos in those days showed no fear of the might of the Spartan Empire, will it not be a disgrace if you, who are Athenians, not afraid of one who is a barbarian, I and a woman? The Argives, moreover, could point to many defects sustained at the hands of Sparta, while you have often defeated the king, and have not once proved inferior either to his servants or to himself. For if ever the king has gained any success against Athens, it has been by bribing the basis of the Hellenes to betray their countrymen. In no other way has he ever succeeded. Indeed, even such success has done him no good. You will find that no sooner had he rendered Athens weak by the help of the Spartans than he had to fight for his own kingdom against Clearchus and Cyrus. His successes, therefore, have not been won in the open field, nor have his plots brought him any good. Now some of you, I notice, are in the habit of speaking contemptuously of Philip, as though he were not worth reckoning with, while you dread the king as a powerful enemy to any whom he chooses to oppose. But if we are not to defend ourselves against Philip, because he is so mean a foe, and are to give way in everything to the king, because he is so formidable, who is there, men of Athens, against whom we shall ever take the field? Men of Athens, you have among you those who are particularly skilful in pleading with you the rights of the rest of the world, and I should be glad to give them the single piece of advice, that they should seek to plead your rights with the rest of the world, and to set an example of duty. It is monstrous to instruct you about rights without doing right oneself and it is not right that a fellow citizen of yours should have studied all the arguments against you and none of those in your favour. Ask yourselves, in God's name, why it is that there is no one in Byzantium to tell the Byzantines that they must not occupy Chalcedon, which belongs to the king and formerly belonged to you, but upon which they had no sort of claim, or that they must not make Silimbria, once your ally, a contributory portion of the Byzantine state, or include the territory of Silimbria within the Byzantine frontier, in defence of the sworn treaty which ordains the independence of the cities. Why was there no one to tell Mausolus, while he lived, and Artemisia after his death, that they must not occupy Kos and Rhodes, and other Hellenic cities as well, which the king their master ceded to the Hellenes by the treaty, and for the sake of which the Hellenes of those days faced many a peril and fought many a gallant fight? Even if there actually are such advisers in both cases, at least it is not likely that they will find listeners. For my part, I believe that it is right to restore the exiled democracy of Rhodes, but even if it were not right, I believe it would be proper to urge you to do it, when I consider the course taken by such speakers as these, and for this reason. If all the world, men of Athens, were bent upon doing right, it would be a disgrace to us if we alone were unwilling to do so. But when all the world is preparing itself in order to be able to commit wrong, then for us alone to abstain from every enterprise on the plea of right is no righteousness to my mind, but cowardice. For I observe that the extent to which rights are admitted is always in proportion to the claimant's power at the moment. I can illustrate this by an instance familiar to all of you. There are two treaties between the Hellenes and the king. The first was made by our own city, and all men praise it. The second by the Spartans, and it is denounced by all. The rights defined in these two treaties are not the same. For whereas a common and equal share of private rights is given by law to weak and strong alike, in a settlement of international rights it is the stronger who legislate for the weaker. Well, you already know what the right course is. It remains to inquire how you can carry out your knowledge into action, and this will be possible if you come to be regarded as public champions of universal liberty. But the great difficulty which you find in doing your duty is, to my mind, natural enough. All other men have only one conflict to face, the conflict with their declared foes. And when these are subdued, there is no further obstacle to their secure enjoyment of their happiness. But for you, there is a double conflict. In addition to that to which all men are liable, there is another which is harder, and which must be faced first, for you have to win the victory in your councils over those who are deliberately working in your midst against the interests of the city, and because, thanks to them, you can effect nothing that is demanded of you without a struggle, it is natural that you should often miss your mark. The chief reason for the fearless adoption of such a course in public life by so many men is perhaps to be found in the benefits which they obtain from those who hire them. Yet at the same time, some of the blame may fairly be laid at your own doors. For you ought, men of Athens, to think of a man's post in public life as you think of his post in the army in the field. 
And how do you think of this? If a man leaves the post assigned to him by his general, you think that he deserves to be disenfranchised and lose all share in the privileges of a citizen. And so when men desert the post of a civil duty, committed to them by our forefathers, and follow an oligarchical policy, they should forfeit the privilege of acting as advisers to yourselves. As it is, while you believe that those of your allies are best disposed towards you, who have sworn to have the same friends and foes as yourselves, the politicians in whom you place most faith are those whom you well know to have chosen the side of the enemies of Athens. It is easy enough, however, to find reasons for accusing them and reproaching all of you. But to find words or actions which will enable us to rectify what is now amiss with us is a task indeed. Moreover, the present is not, perhaps, the time for entering into every point. But if only you can confirm the policy which you have chosen by some suitable action, it may be that other conditions will each in turn show some improvement. I think, therefore, that you ought to take this enterprise in hand with vigour, and to act worthily of your country. Remember with what delights you listen to the praises of your forefathers in the recital of their deeds, the enumeration of their trophies. Consider, then, that your forefathers dedicated these trophies, not that you might gaze at them in idle wonder, but that you might imitate the actions of those who placed them there. End of section 3. Recording by Sabrina Jazz Ainsworth. Section 4 of The Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. The First Philippic. Introduction. Philip became king of Macedonia in 359 BC. Being in great difficulties both from external enemies and from internal division, he made peace with the Athenians, who were supporting the pretensions of Argeas to the throne, in hope of recovering, by agreement with Argeas, the colony of Amphipolis on the Strymon, which they had lost in 424. Philip acknowledged the title of Athens to Amphipolis, and sent home the Athenian prisoners, whom he had captured among the supporters of Argeas, without ransom. The Athenians, however, neglected to garrison Amphipolis. In 358, the year in which Athens temporarily recovered her hold over Euboea by compelling the Thebans to evacuate the island, Philip carried on a successful campaign against the Paeonian and Illyrian tribes, who were standing enemies of Macedonia. For the next three years, Athens was kept occupied by the war with her allies, and Philip saw his opportunity. He besieged Amphipolis. When the citizens sent Hyrax and Stratocles to ask Athens for help, he dispatched a letter promising the Athenians that he would give them Amphipolis when he had taken it, and a secret understanding was arrived at between Philip and the Athenian envoys sent to him that Athens should give him Epidna once a Macedonian town, but now an ally of Athens, in exchange. Athens, therefore, listened neither to Amphipolis nor to Olynthus, which had also made overtures to her. The Olynthians, in consequence, made a treaty with Philip, who gave them Anthemus and promised to help them against their old rival, Potidea, a town in alliance with Athens. The Olynthians, on their part, agreed not to make peace with Athens except in conjunction with him. But Philip, when he had captured Amphipolis by a combination of siege and intrigue, did not give it up to Athens, and instead of waiting to receive Pydna from Athens, besieged and took it, aided once more by treachery from within. In 356 he took Potidea in conjunction with the Olynthians, to whom he gave the town, the Athenians arriving too late to relieve it, and then pursued his conquests along the Thracian coast. Further inland, he expelled the Thracians, allies of Athens, from Crenides, and founded Philippi on the site, in the center of the gold mines of Mount Pangaeus, from which he henceforth derived a very large revenue, while the forests of the district provided him with timber for shipbuilding, of which he took full advantage, for in the next few years his ships made descents upon the Athenian islands of Lemnos and Imbros, plundered the Athenian corn vessels off the coast of Euboa, and even landed a force at Marathon. In the latter part of 356 and in 355, he was occupied with the conquest of the Paeonians and Illyrians, with whom Athens had made an alliance in 356. 
At the end of 355, he laid siege to Methone, the last Athenian port on the Thermaic Gulf, and captured it in 354. Some placed the siege and capture of Methone in 354-3, but an inscription, CIG-270, makes it at least probable that the siege had begun by the last month of 355. In 353, Philip made his way to the Thracian coast and conquered Abdera and Moronia. At Moronia, we find him in company with Pemenes, his former host at Thebes, who had been sent by the Thebans to assist Artabazos in his revolt against the Persian king. And at the same place, he received the Polonides of Cardia, the envoy of the Thracian prince Cursapocles. On his way home, his ships escaped Chares off Neapolis by a ruse. In the same year, he interfered in the affairs of Thessaly, where the Eludidae of Larissa had invited his assistance against Alecophron and Pythalus of Phere, who had invoked the aid of the Phocians. In opposing the Phocians, the antagonists of the Thebans in the Sacred War, Philip was also helping the Thebans themselves and gaining credit as the opponent of the plunderers of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. Onomarchus, the Phocian leader, twice defeated Philip, but was overthrown and slain in 352. Philip took Pharei and Pagasse, its port, occupied Magnesia, and by means of promises obtained financial aid from the Thalassians. The expedition sent by Athens to relieve Pagasse arrived too late, but when Philip, after putting down the tyrants of Pharei and arranging matters in Thessaly, advanced toward the Pass of Thermopylae, an Athenian force, sent on the advice of Diophantus and Eubulus, arrived in time to oblige him to retire to Macedonia. Late in the autumn of 352, we find him once more in Thrace. It was probably now that he assisted the people of Byzantium and Perinthus, together with Amadocus, a rival of Chrysoplates against the latter, with the result that Chrysoplates was obliged to give up his son to Philip as a hostage. Philip had also made an alliance with Cardia, which, like Byzantium, was on bad terms with Athens. He now lay siege to Herion Tychos, a fortress on the Propontis, but illness obliged him to suspend operations, and the rumor of his death prevented the Athenians from sending against him the expedition which they had resolved upon. The retention of her influence in this region was essential for Athens, if her corn supply was to be secure. In 351, on recovering from his illness, he entered the territory of Olynthus, which, contrary to the agreement with him, had made peace with Athens in the previous year, apart from himself. But he did not at present pursue the invasion further. In October 351, Athens sent Charidemus to the Hellespont with ten ships, but no soldiers and little money. If these are the ships alluded to in section 43 of the present speech, the speech must have been delivered after that date. Otherwise, any date after Philip's incursion into the territory of Olynthus would suit the contents of the speech, and many writers place it earlier in the year. The question of the relations of Athens with Philip had been brought forward, and Demosthenes, who had risen first to speak, proposes the creation of a large permanent fleet and of a smaller force for immediate action, laying great stress on the necessity of sending Athenian citizens both to command and to form a substantial proportion of the troops which had so far been mostly mercenaries. The scheme was worked out in detail, both in its military and its financial aspects, and supported with an eloquence and an earnestness which are far in advance of those displayed in the earlier speeches. The statement of Dionysus of Halicarnassus, that the speech as we have it is really a conflation of two speeches, of which the second, beginning at section 30, was delivered in 347, is generally and rightly discredited. If some new subject were being brought before us, men of Athens, I would have waited until most of your ordinary advisers had declared their opinion, and if anything that they said were satisfactory to me, I would have remained silent, and only if it were not so would I have attempted to express my own view. But since we find ourselves once more considering a question upon which they have often spoken, I think I may be reasonably be pardoned for rising first of all. For if their advice to you in the past had been what it ought to have been, you would have had no occasion for the present debate. In the first place, then, men of Athens, we must not be downhearted at our present situation, however wretched it may seem to be. For in the worst feature of the past lies our best hope for the future. 
in the fact that is that we are in our present plight because you are not doing your duty in any respect. For if you were doing all that you should do, and we were still in this evil case, we could not then even hope for any improvement. In the second place, you must bear in mind what some of you have heard from others, and those who know can recollect for themselves how powerful the Spartans were not long ago, and yet how noble and patriotic your own conduct was, when instead of doing anything unworthy of your country, you faced the war with Sparta in defense of the right. Now, why do I remind you of these things? It is because, men of Athens, I wish you to see and to realize that so long as you are on your guard, you have nothing to fear, but that if you are indifferent, nothing can be as you would wish. For this is exemplified for you both by the power of Sparta in those days, to which you rose superior because you gave your minds to your affairs, and by the insolence of Philip today, which troubles us because we care nothing for the things which should concern us. If, however, any of you, men of Athens, when he considers the immense force now at Philip's command, and the city's loss of all his strongholds, thinks that Philip is a foe hard to conquer, I ask him, or right though he is in his belief, to reflect also that there was a time when we possessed Pigna and Patadia and Methoni, when all the surrounding country was our own, and many of the tribes which are now on his side were free and independent, and more inclined to be friendly to us than to him. Now, if in those days Philip had made up his mind that it was a hard thing to fight against the Athenians, with all their fortified outposts on his own frontiers, while he was destitute of allies, he would have achieved none of his recent successes, nor acquired this great power. But Philip saw quite clearly, men of Athens, that all these strongholds were prizes of war, displayed for competition. He saw that in the nature of things the property of the absent belongs to those who are on the spot, and that of the negligent to those who are ready for toil and danger. It is, as you know, by acting upon this belief, that he has brought all those places under his power, and now holds them, some of them by right of capture in war, others in virtue of alliances and friendly understandings, for everyone is willing to grant alliance and to give attention to those whom they see to be prepared and ready to take action as is necessary. If then, men of Athens, you also will resolve to adopt this principle today, the principle which you have never observed before, if each of you can henceforward be relied upon to throw aside all this pretense of incapacity, and to act where his duty bids him, and where his services can be of use to his country, if he who has money will contribute, and he who is of military age will join the campaign, if in one plain word you will resolve henceforth to depend absolutely on yourselves, each man no longer hoping that he will need to do nothing himself, and that his neighbor will do everything for him, then, God willing, you will recover your own. You will take back all that your indolence has lost, and you will have your revenge upon Philip. Do not imagine that his fortune is built to last forever, as if he were a god. He also has those who hate him and fear him, men of Athens, and envy him too, even among those who now seem to be his closest friends. All the feelings that exist in any other body of men must be supposed to exist in Philip's supporters. Now, however, all such feelings are cowed before him. Your slothful apathy has taken away their only rallying point. And it is this apathy that I bid you put off today. Mark the situation, men of Athens. Mark the pitch which the man's outrageous insolence has reached. One, he does not even give you a choice between action and inaction, but threatens you and utters, as we are told, haughty language. For he is not the man to rest content in possession of his conquests. He is always casting his net wider. And while we procrastinate and sit idle, he is setting his toils around us on every side. When then, men of Athens, when I say, will you take the action that is required? What are you waiting for? We are waiting, you say, till it is necessary. But what must we think of all that is happening at this present time? Surely the strongest necessity that a free people can experience is the shame which they must feel at their position. What? Do you want to go round asking one another, is there any news? Could there be any stranger news than that a man of Macedonia is defeating Athenians in war? and ordering the affairs of the Hellenes? Is Philip dead? No, but he is sick. And what difference does that make to you? For if anything should happen to him, you will soon raise up for yourselves a second Philip, if it is thus that you attend to your interests. Indeed, Philip himself has not risen to the successive height through his own strength, 
so much as through our neglect. I go even further. If anything happened to Philip, if the operation of fortune, who always cares for us better than we care for ourselves, were to affect this too for us, you know that if you were at hand, you could descend upon the general confusion and order everything as you wished. But in your present condition, even if circumstances offered you Amphipolis, you could not take it, for your forces and your minds alike are far away. Well, I say, no more of the obligation which rests upon you all to be willing and ready to do your duty. I will assume that you are resolved and convinced. But the nature of the armament which I believe will set you free from such troubles as these, the numbers of the force, the source from which we must obtain funds, and the best and quickest way, as it seems to me, of making all further preparations. All this, men of Athens, I will at once endeavor to explain when I have made one request of you. Give your verdict on my proposal when you have heard the whole of it. Do not prejudge it before I have done. And if at first the force which I propose appears unprecedented, do not think that I am merely creating delays. It is not those whose cry is at once, today, whose proposals will meet our need. For what has already happened cannot be prevented by any expedition now. It is rather he who can show the nature, the magnitude, and the financial possibility of a force which, when provided, will be able to continue in existence either until we are persuaded to break off the war or until we have overcome the enemy, for thus only can we escape further calamity for the future. These things I believe I can show, though I would not stand in the way of any other speaker's professions. It is no less a promise than this that I make. The event will soon test its fulfillment, and you will be the judges of it. First, then, men of Athens, I say that fifty warships must at once be got in readiness, and next that you must be in such a frame of mind that, if any need arises, you will embark in person and sail. In addition, you must prepare transports for half our cavalry and a sufficient number of boats. These, I think, should be in readiness to meet those sudden sallies of his from his own country against Thermopylae, the Chersonese, Olynthus, and any other place which he may select. For we must make him realize that there is a possibility of your rousing yourselves out of your excessive indifference, just as when once you went to Euboea, and before that, as we are told, to Haliartus, and finally, only the other day, to Thermopylae. Such a possibility, even if you are unlikely to make it a reality, as I think you ought to do, is not one which he can treat lightly, and you may thus secure one of two objects. On the one hand, he may know that you are on the alert. He will, in fact, know it well enough. There are only too many persons, I assure you, in Athens itself who report to him all that happens here. And in that case, his apprehensions will ensure his inactivity. But if, on the other hand, he neglects the warning, he may be taken off his guard, for there will be nothing to hinder you from sailing to his country if he gives you the opportunity. These are the measures upon which I say you should all be resolved, and your preparations for them made. But before this, men of Athens, you must make ready a force which will fight without intermission, and do him damage. Do not speak to me of 10,000 or 20,000 mercenaries. I will have none of your paper armies. Give me an army which will be the army of Athens, and will obey and follow the general whom you elect, be there one general or more, be he one particular individual, or be he who he may. You must also provide maintenance for this force. Now what is this force to be? How large is it to be? How is it to be maintained? How will it consent to act in this manner? I will answer these questions point by point. The number of mercenaries, but you must not repeat the mistake which has so often injured you, the mistake of first thinking any measures inadequate, and so voting for the largest proposal, and then when the time for action comes, not even executing the smaller one. You must rather carry out and make provision for the smaller measure, and add to it if it proves too small. The total number of soldiers, I say, must be 2,000, and of these, 500 must be Athenians, beginning from whatever age you think good. They must serve for a definite period, not a long one, but one to be fixed at your discretion, and in relays. The rest must be mercenaries. With these must be cavalry, 200 in number, of whom at least 50 must be Athenians, as with the infantry, and the conditions of service must be the same. You must also find transports for these. And what next? Ten swift ships of war. For he has a fleet. We need swift sailing warships too, to secure the safe passage of the army. 
And how is maintenance to be provided for these? This also I will state and demonstrate as soon as I have given you my reasons for thinking that a force of this size is sufficient, and for insisting that those who serve in it shall be citizens. The size of the force, men of Athens, is determined by the fact that we cannot at present provide an army capable of meeting Philip in the open field. We must make plundering forays, and our warfare must at first be of a predatory nature. Consequently, the force must not be over big. We could then neither pay nor feed it, any more than it must be wholly insignificant. The presence of citizens in the force at sales are required for the following reasons. I am told that Athens once maintained a mercenary force in Corinth, under the command of Polystratus, Iphicrates, Chibrias, and others, and that you yourselves joined in the campaign with them. And I remember hearing that these mercenaries, when they took the field with you and you with them, were victorious over the Spartans. But even since your mercenary forces have gone to war alone, it is your friends and allies that they conquer, while your enemies have grown more powerful than they should be. After a casual glance at the war to which Athens has sent them, they sail off to Artabazus, or anywhere rather than to the war, and the general follows them naturally enough, for his power over them is gone when he can give them no pay. You ask what I bid you do. I bid you take away their excuses both from the general and the soldiers, by supplying pay and placing citizen soldiers at their side as spectators of these mysteries of generalship, for our present methods are a mere mockery. Imagine the question to be put to you, men of Athens, whether you are at peace or no. At peace, you would say, of course not, we are at war with Philip. Now have you not all along been electing from among your own countrymen ten captains and generals and cavalry officers and two masters of the horse? And what are they doing? Except the one single individual whom you happen to send to the seat of war, they are all marshalling your possessions for you with the commissioners of festivals. You are no better than men modeling puppets of clay. Your captains and your cavalry officers are elected to be displayed in the streets, not to be sent to the war. Surely, men of Athens, your captain should be elected from among yourselves, and your master of the horse from among yourselves. Your officers should be your own countrymen, if the force is to be really the army of Athens. As it is, the master of the horse, who is one of yourselves, has to sail to Lemnos, while the master of the horse with the army that is fighting to defend the possessions of Athens is Menelaus. I do not wish to disparage that gentleman, but whoever holds that office ought to have been elected by you. Perhaps, however, while agreeing with all that I have said, you are mainly anxious to hear my financial proposals, which will tell you the amount and the sources of the funds required. I proceed, therefore, with these at once. First for the sum. The cost of the bare rations for the crews with such a force will be 90 talents and a little over. 40 talents for 10 swift ships, and 20 mini a month for each ship, and for the soldiers as much again. Each soldier to receive rations to the value of 10 drachmae a month, and for the cavalry, 200 in number, each to receive 30 drachmae a month, 12 talents. It may be said that the supply of bare rations to the members of the force is an insufficient initial provision, but this is a mistake. I am quite certain that, given so much, the army will provide everything else for itself from the proceeds of war, without injury to a single Hellene or an ally of ours, and that the full pay will be made up by these means. I am ready to sail as a volunteer and to suffer the worst, if my words are untrue. The next question, then, is of ways and means, insofar as the funds are to come from yourselves. I will explain this at once. A schedule of ways and means is read. This, men of Athens, is what we have been able to devise, and when you put our proposals to the vote, you will pass them, if you approve of them, that so your war with Philip may be a war, not of resolutions and dispatches, but of actions. I believe that the value of your deliberations about the war and the armament as a whole would be greatly enhanced if you were to bear in mind the situation of the country against which you are fighting. Remembering that most of Philip's plans are successfully carried out because he takes advantage of winds and seasons. For he waits for the Atesian winds or the winter season and only attacks when it would be impossible for us to effect a passage to the scene of action. Bearing this in mind, we must not carry on the war by means of isolated expeditions. We shall always be too late. We must have a permanent force and armament. 
As our winter stations for the army, we have Lemnos, Thesos, Skiathos, and the islands in that region, which have harbors and corn, and are well supplied with all that an army needs. As to the time of year, whenever it is easy to approach the shore and the winds are not dangerous, our force can without difficulty lie close to the Macedonian coast itself and block the mouths of the ports. How and when he will deploy the force is a matter to be determined when the time comes by the commander whom you put in control of it. What must be provided from Athens is described in the scheme which I have drafted. If men of Athens you first supply the sum I have mentioned, and then after making ready the rest of the armament, soldiers, ships, cavalry, buying the whole force in its entirety, by law, to remain at the seat of war, if you become your own paymasters, your own commissioners of supply, but require your general to account for the actual operations, then there will be an end of these perpetual discussions of one and the same theme, which end in nothing but discussion, and in addition to this, men of Athens, you will, in the first place, deprive him of his chief source of supply. For what is this? Why, he carries on the war at the cost of your own allies, harrying and plundering those who sail the seas. And what will you gain besides this? You will place yourselves out of reach of disaster. It will not be as it was in the past, when he descended upon Lemnos and Imbros, and went off with your fellow citizens as his prisoners of war, or when he seized the vessels off Garistus and levied an enormous sum from them, or when, last of all, he landed at Marathon, seized the sacred trireme, and carried it off from the country, while all the time you can neither prevent these aggressions, nor yet send an expedition which will arrive when you intend it to arrive. But for what reason do you think, men of Athens, do the festival of the Panathenaea and the festival of the Dionysia always take place at the proper time, whether those to whom the charge of either festival is allotted are specially qualified persons or not, festivals upon which you spend larger sums of money than upon any armament whatsoever, and which involve an amount of trouble and preparation which are unique, so far as I know, in the whole world. And yet your armaments are always behind the time. At Methoni, at Pegesi, at Petidia. It is because for the festivals all is arranged by law. Each of you knows long beforehand who is to supply the chorus, and who is to be the steward of the games, for his tribe. He knows what he is to receive, and when, and from whom, and what he is to do with it. No detail is here neglected, and nothing is left indefinite. But in all that concerns war and our preparation for it, there is no organization, no revision, no definiteness. Consequently, it is not until the news comes that we appoint our triarchs and institute exchanges of property for them, and inquire into ways and means. When that is done, we first resolve that the resident aliens and the independent freedmen shall go on board. Then we change our minds and say that citizens shall embark. Then that we will send substitutes, and while all these delays are occurring, the object of the expedition is already lost. For we spend on preparation the time when we should be acting and the opportunities which events afford will not wait for our slothful evasions. Well, as for the forces on which we think we can rely in the meantime, when the critical moment comes, they are tried and found wanting. And Philip's insolence has reached such a pitch that he has sent such a letter as the following to the Eboians. The letter is read. The greater part of the statements that have been read are true, men of Athens, and they ought not to be true but I admit that they may possibly be unpleasant to hear. And if the course of future events would pass over all that a speaker passes over in his speech to avoid giving pain, we should be right in speaking with a view to your pleasure. But if attractive words spoken out of season bring their punishment in actual reality, then it is disgraceful to blind our eyes to the truth, to put off everything that is unpleasant, to refuse to understand even so much as this, that those who conduct war rightly must not follow in the wake of events but must be beforehand with them. For just as a general may be expected to lead his army, so those who debate must lead the course of affairs in order that what they resolve upon may be done, and that they may not be forced to follow at the heels of events. You, men of Athens, have the greatest power in the world, warships, infantry, cavalry, revenue. But none of these elements of power have you used as you ought down to this very day. The method of your warfare with Philip is just that of barbarians in a boxing match. Hit one of them, and he hugs the place. Hit him on the other side, and there go his hands. But as for guarding or looking his opponent in the face, he neither can nor will do it. It is the same with you. If you hear that Philip is in the Chersonese, 
you resolve to make an expedition there. If he is at Thermopylae, you send one there. And wherever else he may be, you run up and down in his steps. It is he that leads your forces. You have never of yourselves come to any salutary decision in regard to the war. No single event do you ever discern before it occurs, before you have heard that something has happened or is happening. Perhaps there was room for this backwardness until now, but now we are at the very crisis, and such an attitude is possible no longer. Surely, men of Athens, it is one of the gods, one who blushes for Athens as he sees the course which events are taking, that has inspired Philip with this restless activity. If he were content to remain at peace, in possession of all that he has won by conquest or by forestalling us, if he had no further plans, even then the record against us as a people, a record of shame and cowardice and all that is most dishonorable, would, I think, seem complete enough to some of you. But now he is always making some new attempt, always grasping after something more. And unless your spirit has utterly departed, his conduct will perhaps bring you out into the field." It amazes me, men of Athens, that not one of you remembers with any indignation that this war had its origin in our intention to punish Philip, and that now, at the end of it, the question is, how are we to escape disaster at his hands? But that he will not stay his progress until someone arrests it is plain enough. Are we then to wait for that? Do you think that all is right when you dispatch nothing but empty ships and somebody's hopes? Shall we not embark? Shall we not now, if never before, go forth ourselves and provide at least some small proportion of Athenian soldiers? Shall we not sail to the enemy's country? But I heard the question, at what point on his coast are we to anchor? The war itself, men of Athens, if you take it in hand, will discover his weak points. But if we sit at home listening to the mutual abuse and recriminations of our orators, you can never realize any of the results that you ought to realize. I believe that whenever any portion of Athens is sent with the forces, even if the whole city does not go, the favor of heaven and of fortune fights on our side. But whenever you dispatch anywhere a general with an empty resolution and some platform hopes to support him, then you achieve nothing that you ought to achieve. Your enemies laugh at you, and your allies are in deadly fear of all such armaments. It is impossible, utterly impossible, that any one man should be able to effect all that you wish for you. He can give undertakings and promises. He can accuse this man and that. And the result is that your fortunes are ruined. For when the general is at the head of wretched, unpaid mercenaries, and when there are those in Athens who lie to you lightheartedly about all that he does, and on the strength of the tales that you hear, you pass decrees at random, what must you expect? How then can this state of things be terminated? Only men of Athens, when you expressly make the same men soldiers, witnesses of their general's actions, and judges at his examination when they return home. For then the issue of your fortunes will not be a tale which you hear, but a thing which you will be on the spot to see. So shameful is the pass which matters have now reached, that each of your generals is tried for his life before you two or three times, but does not dare to fight in mortal combat with the enemy even once. They prefer the death of kidnappers and brigands to that of a general. For it is a felon's death to die by sentence of the court. The death of a general is to fall in battle with the enemy. Some of us go about saying that Philip is negotiating with Sparta for the overthrow of the Thebans and the breaking up of the free states. Others that he has sent ambassadors to the king. Others that he is fortifying cities in Illyria. We all go about inventing each his own tale. I quite believe, men of Athens, that he is intoxicated with the greatness of his successes, and entertains many such visions in his mind, for he sees that there are none to hinder him, and he is elated at his achievements. But I do not believe that he has chosen to act in such a way that the most foolish persons in Athens can know what he intends to do, for no persons are so foolish as newsmongers. But if we dismiss all such tales and attend only to the certainty that the man is our enemy, that he is robbing us of our own, that he has insulted us for a long time, that all that we ever expected any one to do for us has proved to be against us, that the future is in our own hands, that if we will not fight him now in his own country, we shall perhaps be obliged to do so in ours. If I say we are assured of this, then we shall have made up our minds all right, and shall be quit of idle words. For you have not to speculate what the future may be, 
you have only to be assured that the future must be evil unless you give heed and are ready to do your duty. Well, I have never yet chosen to gratify you by saying anything which I have not felt certain would be for your good. And today I have spoken freely and without concealment, just what I believe. I could wish to be as sure of the good that a speaker will gain by giving you the best advices of that which you will gain by listening to him. I should then have been far happier than I am. As it is, I do not know what will happen to me for what I have said. But I have chosen to speak in the sure conviction that if you carry out my proposals, it will be for your good. And may the victory rest with that policy which will be for the good of all. End of section 4. Section 5 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. The Olynthiac Orations. 1 through 3. Introduction. It has already been noticed that when Philip took Amphipolis in 357 BC, the Olynthians made overtures to the Athenians, with whom they had been at war for some years, and that being rejected, they became allies of Philip, who gave them Anthemus and Pediate. In 352, alarmed at Philip's growing power, they once more applied to Athens. Peace was made, and negotiations began with regard to an alliance. In 351, Philip appeared in the territory of Olynthus. He did not, however, at once carry the invasion further, but took pains during this year and the next to foster a Macedonian party in the town. In 349, Philip virtually declared war on the Olynthians by demanding the surrender of his stepbrother, Aridaeus, who had taken refuge with them. The Olynthians again appealed to Athens. An alliance was made. Charis was sent with thirty ships and two thousand mercenaries, but seems to have mismanaged the war by misfortune or by design. Probably he had been badly supplied with funds, and instead of helping Olynthus, resorted to acts of piracy to satisfy his men. The Macedonian troops proceeded to take Stadiera and other towns of the Olynthian League though Philip still professed to have no hostile intentions against Olynthus. Cares was recalled and put on his trial, and probably in response to a further message from Olynthus, Charidemus was transferred thither from the Hellenspont. With a considerable mercenary force at his disposal, Charidemus overran Paulina and Bautaea, and did some damage to Philip's territory but afterwards gave himself up to dissipation in Olynthus. In the meantime, some of the Thessalians had become restless under Philip's supremacy, and he was obliged to undertake an expedition to suppress the revolt and to put down Piatolus, who had apparently become tyrant of Phere once more, though he had been expelled in 352. But early in 348, he appeared in person in Chalcidice, and took one after another of the towns of the League, including Messirberna, the port of Olynthus, and Tyrone. He thrice defeated the Olynthians in battle, and at last obtained possession of Olynthus itself by the treachery of Euthycrates and Lastenes, the commanders of the Olynthian cavalry. Athens had probably been occupied during the early part of the year with an expedition which she sent against the advice of Demosthenes to help Plutarchus of Eritrea to repel attacks which were partly, at least, instigated by Philip, and in consequence she had done little for Olynthus, though on a request of the Olynthians for cavalry she had ordered some of those which had been sent to Avia to go to Olynthus, and these may have been the Athenians whom Philip captured in that city. The seventeen ships, 2,000 infantry, and 300 cavalry, all citizens, which Athens dispatched under Cares, in response to a last urgent appeal from Olynthus, were delayed by storms and arrived too late. Philip entirely destroyed Olynthus 
and thirty-two other towns, sold their inhabitants into slavery, brought the whole of Chalcadiki within the Macedonian Empire, and celebrated his conquests by a festival in honor of the Olympian Zeus at Diem. The first Olynthiac oration was delivered before Olynthus itself was attacked, or any other towns actually taken, and both the first and the second, before the discontent with Philip and Thessaly had taken an active form. Both, that is, belong to the summer of 349, and the situation implied is very much the same in both. The first was perhaps spoken when the Olynthians first appealed to Athens in that year, before the mission of Cares the second to counteract the effect of something which had caused despondency in Athens, possibly the conduct of the Athenian generals or the account given by other orators of Philip's power. In both, Demosthenes urges the importance of resisting Philip while he is still far away, and of sending not mercenaries, but a citizen army, and while hinting at what he regards as the true solution of the financial difficulty, proposes a special war tax. The solution which he thinks the right one is more explicitly described in the third Olynthiac, spoken probably in the autumn of the same year, and certainly at a time when the situation had become much more grave. The root of the financial difficulty lay in the existence of a law which prohibited, evidently under severe penalties, any proposal to devote to military purposes that portion of the revenues which constituted the festival or theoric fund, and was for the most part distributed to the citizens to enable them to take part in the public festivals, and so join in fulfilling what was no doubt a religious duty as well as a pleasure. This particular form of expenditure is stated to have been introduced by the demagogue Agirios in 394, when it revived in an extended form a distribution of theater money instituted late in the 5th century by Cleophon. But the special law in question appears to have been of recent date, and was almost certainly the work of Evolus and his party. Demosthenes himself proposes an extraordinary legislative commission to repeal the mischievous laws, and leave the way clear for financial reform. At the same time, he attacks the whole policy of Evolus, charging him with distributing doles without regard to public service, adding to the amenities of Athens instead of maintaining her honor in war, and enriching her politicians while degrading her people. The main object of the speech was unsuccessful. And just about this time, though whether before or after the speech is disputed, Apollodorus proposed that the people should decide whether the surplus revenues should go to the festival fund or be applied to military purposes and was heavily fined for the illegality of the proposal. The three Olynthiacs rank high among the orations of Demosthenes. Some passages indeed show that he had hardly as yet appreciated the genius of Philip, or the unlikelihood of his making a false move either through overconfidence or because he had come to the end of his resources. But the noble patriotism of the speaker, the lofty tone of his political reflections, the clearness of his diagnosis of the evils of his time and the fearlessness of his appeal for loyal and united self-sacrifice are nowhere more conspicuous. End introduction. The First Olynthiac. I believe, men of Athens, that you would give a great sum to know what policy in reference to the matter which you are now considering will best serve the interests of the city. And since that is so, you ought to be ready and eager to listen to those who desire to give you their advice. For not only can you hear and accept any useful proposals which a speaker may have thought out before he came here, but such, I conceive, is your fortune, that the right suggestion will often occur to some of those present on the spur of the moment. And out of all these suggestions, it should be easy for you to choose the most advantageous course. The present time, men of Athens, seems almost to cry aloud that you must take matters into your own hands yonder, if you have any interest in a successful termination of the crisis. And yet, our attitude appears to be, I do not know what. My own opinion, at all events, is that you should at once resolve to send this assistance, 
that you should prepare for the departure of the expedition at the first possible moment. You must not fall victims to the same error as before, and that you should dispatch an embassy to announce our intention, and to be present at the scene of action. For what we have most to fear is this, that he, with his unscrupulous cleverness in taking advantage of circumstances, now it may be by making concessions, now by uttering threats, which he may well seem likely to fulfill, now by misrepresenting ourselves and our absence from the scene, may turn and wrest to his own advantage some of the vital elements of our power. And yet it may fairly be said, men of Athens, that our best hope lies in that very circumstance which renders Philip's power so hard to grapple with. The fact that the entire control over everything, open or secret, is concentrated in the hands of a single man, that he is at one and the same time general, master, and treasurer, that he is always present in person with his army, all this is a great advantage, insofar as military operations must be prompt and well-timed, but as regards the compact which he would so gladly make with the Olynthians, the effect is just the reverse. For the Olynthians know well that they are not fighting now for honor and glory, nor for a strip of territory, but to avert the devastation and enslavement of their country. They know how he treated those who betrayed to him their city at Amphipolis, and those who received him at Pydna. And it is, I imagine, universally true that tyranny is a faithless friend to a free state, and that most of all, when they occupy adjoining territories. With this knowledge, men of Athens, and with all the reflections that the occasion calls for in your minds, I say that now, if ever before, you must make your resolve, rouse all your energies, and give your minds to the war. You must contribute gladly, you must go forth in person, you must leave nothing undone. There is no longer any reason or excuse remaining which can justify you in refusing to do your duty. For everyone was but recently harping on the desirability of exciting Olynthus to war with Philip. And this has now come to pass of itself and in the way which most completely suits your interests. Had they taken up the war because you had persuaded them to do so? Their alliance might perhaps have been precarious, and their resolution might only have carried them a certain way. But now their detestation of Philip is based upon grievances which affect themselves, and we may suppose that a hostility which is occasioned by their own fears and sufferings will be a lasting one. Since, therefore, men of Athens, such an opportunity has been thrown in your way, you must not let it go nor fall victims to the mistake for which you have often suffered before. If, for instance, when we had returned from our expedition in aid of the Evians, and Hierox and Stratocles came from Amphipolis and stood upon this platform and urged us to sail and take over the city, if, I say, we had continued to display in our own interest the eagerness with which we displayed in the deliverance of the Evians, you would have kept Amphipolis then, and we should have been free from all the trouble that we have had since. And again, when news kept coming of the investment of Pydna, Potidae, Mitoni, Pegase, and all the other places, I will not stay to enumerate them all, if we had acted at once, and had gone to the rescue of the first place attacked, with the energy which we ought to have shown, we should now have found Philip much less proud and difficult to deal with. As it is, we are always sacrificing the present, always fancying that the future will turn out well of itself. And so we have raised Philip to a position of such importance as no king of Macedonia has ever before attained. And now an opportunity has come to Athens in the crisis at Olynthus, as great as any of those former ones. And I believe men of Athens, that one who was to draw up a true account of the blessings which have been given us by the gods, would, in spite of much that is not as it should be, find great cause for thankfulness to them, and naturally so. 
for our many losses in the war must in fairness be set down to our own indifference. But that we did not suffer such losses long ago, and that an alliance has presented itself to us, which, if we will only take advantage of it, will act as a counterpoise to them. All this, I for one, should set down as a favor due to their goodness towards us. But it is, I imagine, in politics, as it is in money-making. If a man is able to keep all that he gets, he is abundantly grateful to fortune. But if he loses it all before he is aware, he loses with it his memory of fortune's kindness. So it is in politics. When men have not made a right use of their opportunities, they do not remember any good that heaven may actually have granted them. For it is by the ultimate issue that men estimate all that they have enjoyed before. Therefore, men of Athens, you must pay the very utmost heed to the future, that by the better use you make of it, you may wipe out the dishonor of the past. But if you sacrifice these men also, men of Athens, and Philip, in consequence, reduces Olynthus to subjection, I ask any of you to tell me what is to prevent him from marching where he pleases. Is there a man among you, men of Athens, who considers our studies the steps by which Philip, weak enough at first, has become so strong? First he took Amphipolis, next Pydna, then again Potidae, and then Metoni. Next he set foot in Thessaly. Then when Phere, Pagasi, Magnesia were secured for his purposes, just as it suited him, he departed to Thrace. In Thrace, after expelling one prince and setting up another, he fell ill. When he grew easier again, he showed no inclination to take things easily, but at once attacked the Athenians. And I am passing over his campaigns against the Illyrians and the Paeonians, against Erebus, and in every possible direction. Why, I may be asked, do I mention these things at the present moment? I wish you to understand, men of Athens, and to realize these two points. First, the unprofitableness of perpetually sacrificing your interests one by one. And secondly, the restless activity which is a part of Philip's very being, and which will not allow him to content himself with his achievements and remain at peace. For if it is to be his fixed resolve that he must always be aiming at something greater than he has yet attained, and ours that we will never set ourselves resolutely to work, ask yourselves what you can expect to be the end of the matter. In God's name, is there one of you so innocent as to know that the war will be transferred from Olynthus to Attica if we pay no heed? But if that happens, men of Athens, I fear that we shall be like men who lightheartedly borrow at a high rate of interest, and after a brief period of affluence, lose even their original estate that like them we shall find that our carelessness has cost us dear, that through making pleasure our standard in everything, we shall find ourselves driven to do many of those unpleasant things which we wished to avoid, and shall find our position, even in our own country, imperiled. I may be told that it is easy to criticize. Any one can do that but that a political adviser is expected to offer some practical proposal to meet the existing situation. Now I am well aware, men of Athens, that in the event of any disappointment, it is not upon those who are responsible that your anger falls, but upon those who have spoken last upon the subject in question. Yet I do not think that consideration for my own safety should lead me to conceal my conviction as to the course which your interests demand. I say then that there are two things which you must do to save the situation. You must rescue these towns for the Olynthians, and send troops to accomplish this, and you must damage Philip's country with your ships and with a second body of troops. 
If you neglect either of these things, our campaign, I greatly fear, will be in vain. For suppose that you inflict damage on his country, and that he allows you to do so while he reduces Olynthus. He will have no difficulty in repelling you when he returns. Suppose, on the other hand, that you only go to the help of Olynthus. He will see that he has nothing to fear at home, and so he will sit down before the town and remain at his task, until time enables him to get the better of the besieged. The expedition, therefore, must be large, and it must be in two parts. Such is my view with regard to the expedition. As to the sources of supply, you have funds, men of Athens, funds larger than anyone else in the world. But you appropriate these without scruple, just as you choose. Now, if you will assign these to your troops, you need no further supplies. Otherwise, not only do you need further supplies, you are destitute of supplies altogether. Well, does someone say, do you move that this money should form a war fund? I assure you that I make no such motion, for while I do indeed believe that a force ought to be made ready, and that this money should form a war fund, and that the receipt of money should be connected as part of one and the same system with the performance of duty, you, on the contrary, think it right to take the money after your present fashion for your festivals and spare yourselves trouble. And therefore, I suppose, only your resource is a general tax, larger or smaller, according to the amount required. In any case, we need funds, and without funds, nothing can be done that we ought to do. Various other sources of supply are suggested by different persons. Choose whichever you think best of these, and get to work, while you have the opportunity. It is worth while to remember, and to take into account, the nature of Philip's position at this moment, for neither are his affairs at present in such good order, or in so perfectly satisfactory a state as might appear to any but a careful observer, nor would he ever have commenced this present war if he had thought that he would really have to fight. He hoped at first that by his mere advance he would carry all before him, and he has since discovered his mistake. This disappointment, then, is the first thing which disturbs him and causes him great despondency. And next there is the disposition of the Thessalians, naturally inconstant as we know it has always been found by all men, and what it has always been, that in the highest degree Philip finds it now. For they have formally resolved to demand from him the restitution of Pagasae. They have prevented him from fortifying Magnesia, and I myself heard it stated that they intend even to refuse him the enjoyment of their harbor and market dues for the future. These, they say, should go to maintain the public administration of Thessaly, instead of being taken by Philip. But if he is deprived of these funds, the resources from which he must maintain his mercenaries will be reduced to the narrowest limits. Nay, more, we must surely suppose that the chieftains of the Paeonians and Illyrians, and in fact all such personages, would prefer freedom to slavery, for they are not accustomed to obey orders, and the man, they say, is a bully. Heaven knows there is nothing incredible in the statement. Unmerited success is to foolish minds a fountain head of perversity so that it is often harder for men to keep the good they have than it was to obtain it. It is for you, then, men of Athens, to regard his difficulty as your opportunity, to take up your share of the burden with readiness, to send embassies to secure all that is required, to join the forces yourselves, and to stir up everyone else to do so. Only consider what would happen if Philip got such an opportunity to strike at us, and there was war on our frontier. Can you not imagine how readily he would march against us? Does it arouse no shame in you that when you have the opportunity, you should not dare 
to do to him even as much as you would have to suffer were he able to inflict it? There is a further point, men of Athens, which must not escape you. I mean that you have now to choose whether you are to carry on war yonder, or whether he is to do so in your own country. If the resistance of Olynthus is maintained, you will fight there, and will inflict damage on Philip's territory, while you remain secure in the enjoyment of this land of your own which you now possess. But if Philip captures Olynthus, who is to hinder him from marching to Athens? The Thebans? It seems, I fear, too bitter a thing to say, but they will be glad to join him in the invasion. The Phocians? They cannot protect their own country unless you go to their aid or some other power. But, my good sir, you say, he will not want to march here, and yet it would be one of the strangest things in the world if he, when he has the power, he does not carry out the threats which he now blurts out in spite of the folly that they show. But I suppose that I need not even point out how vast is the difference between war here and war in his country. For you had to camp outside the walls yourselves for only thirty days, and to take from the country such things as men in camp must have. And I am assuming that there is no enemy in the country. I believe that the loss your farmers would suffer would exceed your whole expenditure on the war up to the present time. What then? must we think, will be the extent of our loss, even if war comes to our doors. And besides the loss, there is his insolence, and the shame of our position, which to right-minded men is as serious as any loss. When you take a comprehensive view of these things, you must all go to the rescue and stave the war off yonder. You who are well to do, in order that with a small expense and defense of the great fortunes which you quite rightly enjoy, you may reap the benefit of the remainder without fear. You who are of military age, that you might gain your experience of war in Philip's country and so become formidable guardians of a fatherland unspoiled. And your orators, that they may find it easy to render an account of their public life for your judgment upon their conduct will itself depend upon the position in which you find yourselves, and that may be a happy one on every ground. End of section 5section six of the Public Orations of Demosthenes this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard The Second Olynthiac Many as are the occasions, men of Athens, on which we may discern the manifestation of the good will of heaven towards this city, one of the most striking is to be seen in the circumstances of the present time. For that men should have been found to carry on war against Philip, men whose territory borders on his, and who possesses some power, men, above all, whose sentiments in regard to the war are such that they think of the proposed compact with him not only as untrustworthy, but as the very ruin of their country, this seems to be certainly the work of a superhuman, a divine beneficence. And so, men of Athens, we must take care that we do not treat ourselves less well than circumstances have treated us. For it is a shameful thing, nay, it is the very depth of shame, to throw away openly not only cities and places which were once in our power, but even the allies and the opportunities which have been provided for us by fortune. Now to describe at length the power of Philip, men of Athens, and to incite you to the performance of your duty by such a recital, is not, I think, a satisfactory proceeding. And for this reason, that while all that can be said on this subject tends to Philip's glory, 
it is a story of failure on our part. For the greater the extent to which his success surpasses his deserts, the greater is the admiration with which the world regards him. While for your part, the more you have fallen short of the right use of your opportunities, the greater is the disgrace that you have incurred. I will therefore pass over such considerations, for any honest inquirer must see that the causes of Philip's rise to greatness lie in Athens, and not in himself. One of the services for which he has to thank those whose policy is determined by his interest, services for which you ought to require their punishment, the present is not, I see, the moment to speak. But apart from these things, there are things which may be said, and which it is better that you should all have heard, things which, if you will examine them aright, constitute a grave reproach against him, and these I will try to tell you. If I called him perjured and faithless, without giving his actions in evidence, my words would be treated as idle abuse, and rightly. And it happens that to review all his actions up to the present time, and to prove the charge in every case, requires only a short speech. It is well, I think, that the story should be told, for it will serve two purposes. First, to make plain the real badness of the man's character, and secondly, to let those who are over-alarmed at Philip as if he were invincible, see that he has come to the end of all those forms of deceit by which he rose to greatness and that his career is already drawing to a close. For I too, men of Athens, should be regarding Philip with intense fear and admiration, if I saw that his rise was the result of a righteous policy. But when I study and consider the facts, I find that originally— when certain persons wish to drive from your presence the Olynthians who desire to address you from this place, Philip won over our innocent minds by saying that he would deliver up Amphipolis to us and by inventing the famous secret understanding, that he afterwards conciliated the Olynthians by seizing Potiadea, which was yours, and injuring their former allies by handing it over to themselves and that last of all he recently won over the Thessalians by promising to give up Magnesia to them, and undertaking to carry on the war with the Phocians on their behalf. There is absolutely no one who has ever had dealings with him that he has not deluded, and it is by deceiving and winning over, one after another, those who were in their blindness did not realize what he was, that he has risen as he has done. And therefore, just as it was by these deceptions that he rose to greatness, in the days when each people fancied that he intended to do some service to themselves, so it is these same deceptions which should drag him down again, now that he stands convicted of acting for his own ends throughout. Such then is the crisis, men of Athens, to which Philip's fortunes have now come. If it is not so, let anyone come forward and show me, or rather you, that what I say is untrue, or that those who have been deceived at the outset trust him as regards the future, or that those who have been brought into unmerited bondage would not gladly be free. But if any of you, while agreeing with me so far, still fancies that Philip will maintain his hold by force— because he has already occupied fortified posts and harbors and similar positions, he is mistaken. When power is cemented by goodwill, and the interest of all who join in a war is the same, then men are willing to share the labor, to endure the misfortunes, and to stand fast. But when a man has become strong, as Philip has done, by a grasping and wicked policy, the first excuse, the least stumble, throws him from his seat and dissolves the alliance. It is impossible, men of Athens, utterly impossible to acquire power that will last by unrighteousness, by perjury, and by falsehood. Such power holds out for a moment, and for a brief hour it blossoms brightly, perhaps with fair hopes. But times detects the fraud, 
and the flower falls withered about its stem. In a house or a ship or any other structure, it is the foundations that must be the strongest, and no less, I believe, must the principles, which are the foundation of men's actions, by those of truth and righteousness. Such qualities are not to be seen today in the past acts of Philip. I say, then, that we should help the Olynthians, and the best and quickest method which can be proposed is the method which I approve. Further, we should send an embassy to the Thessalians, to some to inform them of our intention, to others to spur them on, for even now they have been resolved to demand the restitution of Pegasae and to make representations in regard to Magnesia. Take care, however, men of Athens, that our envoys may not only have words to speak, but also actions of yours to point to. Let it be seen that you have gone forth in a manner that is worthy of Athens, and are already in action. Words without the reality must always appear a vain and empty thing, and above all when they come from Athens, for the more we seem to excel in the glib use of such language, the more it is distrusted by everyone. The change, then, which is pointed out to them, must be great. The conversion striking. They must see you paying your contributions, marching to war, doing everything with a will, if any of them is to listen to you. And if you resolve to accomplish all this in very deed, as it should be accomplished, not only will the feeble and untrustworthy nature of Philip's alliances be seen, but the weakness of his own empire and power will also be detected. The power and empire of Macedonia is indeed, to speak generally, an element which tells considerably as an addition to any other power. You found it so when it helped you against the Olynthians in the days of Timotheus. The Olynthians, in their turn, found its help of some value in combination with their own strength against Potidaea, and it has recently come to the aid of the Thessalians in their disordered and disturbed condition against the ruling dynasty, and wherever a small addition is made to a force, it helps in every way. But in itself, the Macedonian Empire is weak and full of manifold evils. Philip has in fact rendered his own tenure of it even more precarious than it naturally was by these very wars and campaigns which might be supposed to prove his power. For you must not imagine, men of Athens, that Philip and his subjects delight in the same things. Philip has a passion for glory, that is, his ambition, and he has deliberately chosen to risk the consequences of a life of action and danger preferring the glory of achieving more than any king of Macedonia before him to a life of security. But his subjects have no share in the honor and glory. Constantly battered about by all these expeditions up and down, they are vexed with incessant hardships. They are not suffered to pursue their occupations or attend to their own affairs, for the little that they produce, as best they can, they can find no market, the trading stations of the country being closed on account of the war. From these facts, it is not difficult to discover the attitude of the Macedonians in general toward Philip, and as for the mercenaries and infantry of the guard who surround him, though they have the reputation of being a fine body of well-drilled warriors. I am told by a man who has been in Macedonia, and who is incapable of falsehood, that they are no better than any other body of men. Granted that there may be experienced campaigners and fighters among them, yet he tells me Philip is so jealous of honor that he thrusts all such men away from him, in his anxiety to get the credit of every achievement for himself. For in addition to all his other qualities, his jealousy is unsurpassable. On the other hand, any generally temperate or upright man who cannot endure the dissolute life there, day by day, nor the drunkenness and the lewd revels, is thrust on one side and counts for nothing, 
Thus he is left with brigands and flatterers, and men who, when in their cups, indulge in dances of a kind which I shrink from naming to you now. And it is evident that this report is true, for men whom every one tried to drive out of Athens, as far viler than even the very juggler in the street, Calais, the public slave, and men like him, players of farces, composers of indecent songs written at the expense of their companions in the hope of raising a laugh, these are the men he likes and keeps about him. You may think that these are trivial things, men of Athens, but they are weighty in the judgment of every right-minded man, as illustrations of the temper with which Philip is cursed. At present, I suppose, these facts are overshadowed by his continual prosperity. Success has a wonderful power of throwing a veil over shameful things like these. But let him only stumble, and then all these features in his character will be displayed in their true light. And I believe, men of Athens, that the revelation is not far off, if heaven be willing, and you desirous of it. So long as a man is in good health, he is unconscious of any weakness. But if any illness comes upon him, the disturbance affects every weak point, be it a rupture or a sprain or anything else that is unsound in his constitution. And as with the body, so it is with a city or a tyrant. So long as they are at war abroad, the mischief is hidden from the world at large, but the close grapple of war on the frontier brings all to light. Now if any of you, men of Athens, seeing Philip's good fortune, think that this makes him a formidable enemy to fight against, he reasons like a sensible man, for fortune weighs heavily in the scale. Nay, fortune is everything in all human affairs. And yet, if I were given the choice, it is the fortune of Athens that I should choose rather than that of Philip, provided that you yourselves are willing to act even to a small extent as you should act, for I see that there are far more abundant grounds for expecting the good will of heaven on your side than on his. But here, of course, we are sitting idle, and one who is a sluggard himself cannot require his friends to help him, much less the gods. It is not to be wondered at that Philip, who goes on campaigns and works hard himself and is always at the scene of action and lets no opportunity go, no season pass, should get the better of us who delay and pass resolutions and ask for news. Nor do I wonder at it. It is the opposite that would have been wonderful if we who do nothing that those who are at war ought to do were successful against one who leaves nothing undone. But this I do wonder at, that you, who once raised your hand against Sparta in the defense of the rights of the Hellenists, you who with opportunities often open to you for grasping large advantages for yourselves, would not take them but to secure for others their rights, spent your own fortunes in war contributions, and always bore the brunt of the dangers of the campaign, that you, I say, are now shrinking from marching and hesitating to make any contribution to save your own possessions, and that, though you have often saved the rest of the Hellenists, now all together and now each in their turn, you are sitting idle when you have lost what was your own. I wonder at this, and I wonder also, men of Athens, that none of you is able to reckon up the time during which you have been fighting with Philip, and to consider what you have been doing while all this time has been going by. Surely you must know that it is while we have been delaying, hoping that someone else would act, accusing one another, bringing one another to trial, hoping anew, in fact, doing practically what we are doing now, that all the time has passed. And have you now so little sense, men of Athens, as to hope that the very same policy which has made the position of the city a bad one instead of a good will actually make it a good one instead of a bad? Why is it contrary both to reason and to nature to think so? 
It is always much easier to retain than to acquire. But now, owing to the war, none of our old possessions is left for us to retain, and so we must needs acquire. This, therefore, is our own personal and immediate duty. And accordingly I say that you must contribute funds. You must go on service in person with a good will. You must accuse no one before you have become masters of the situation. And then you must honor those who deserve and praise and punish the guilty with a judgment based upon the actual facts. You must get rid of all excuses and all deficiencies on your own part. You cannot examine mercilessly the actions of others unless you yourselves have done all that your duty requires. For why is it, do you think, men of Athens, that all the generals whom you dispatch avoid this war and discover private wars of their own, if little of the truth must be told even about the generals? It is because in this war the prizes for which the war is waged are yours, and if they are captured, you will take them immediately for your own. But the dangers are the personal privilege of your commanders, and no pay is forthcoming. And the prophets, Lomsakoas, Sigium, and the ships which they plunder, go to the commanders and their men. Each force, therefore, takes the road that leads to its own advantage. For your part, when you turn your attention to the serious condition of your affairs, you first bring the commanders to trial, and then when you have given them a hearing, and you have been told of the difficulties which I have described, you acquit them. The result, therefore, is that while you are quarreling with one another, and broken into factions, one party persuaded of this, another of that, the public interest suffers. You used men of Athens, to pay taxes by boards. Today you conduct your politics by boards. On either side there is an orator as a leader and a general under him, and for the three hundred there are those who come to shout. The rest of you distribute yourselves between the two parties, some on either side. This system you must give up. You must even now become your own masters. You must give to all alike their share in discussion, in speech, and in action. If you assign to one body of men the function of issuing orders to you like tyrants, to another that of compulsory service as triarchs or taxpayers or soldiers, and to another only that of voting their condemnation without taking any share in the labor, nothing that ought to be done will be done in time. For the injured section will always be in default, and you will only have the privilege of punishing them instead of the enemy. To sum up, all must contribute, each according to his wealth, in a fair proportion. All must go on active service in turn until you have all served. You must give a hearing to all who come forward and choose the best course out of all that you hear, not the course proposed by this or that particular person. If you do this, you will not only commend the prosper of that course at the time, but you will commend yourselves hereafter, for the whole position of your affairs will be a better one. End of section 6 Section 7 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devin Tatlow. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. The Third Olympia. Very different reflections suggest themselves to my mind. I, men of Athens, when I turn my eyes to our real situation, and when I think of the speeches that I hear. For I observe that the speeches are all concerned with the taking of vengeance upon Philip, whereas in reality matters have gone so far 
that we have to take care that we are not ourselves the first to suffer, so that those who speak of vengeance are actually, as it seems to me, suggesting to you a false conception of the situation which you are discussing. That there was a time when the city could both keep her own possessions in safety and punish Philip. I am very well aware, for it was not long ago, but within my own lifetime, that both these things were so. But I am convinced that it is now quite enough for us as a first step to make sure of the preservation of our allies. If this is safely secured, we shall then be able to consider upon whom vengeance is to fall, and in what way. But until the first step is properly conceived, I consider it idle to say anything whatever about the last. If ever the most anxious deliberation was required, it is required in the present crisis, and my greatest difficulty is not to know what is the proper advice to give you in regard to the situation. I am at a loss rather to know, men of Athens, in what manner I should address you in giving it. For I am convinced by what I have heard with my own ears in this place that, for the most part, the objects of our policy have slipped from our grasp, not because we do not understand what our duty is, but because we will not do it. And I ask you to suffer me if I speak without reserve, and to consider only whether I speak truly, and with this object in view, that the future may be better than the past. For you see that it is because certain speakers make your gratification the aim of their addresses that things have gone on getting worse, till at last the extremity has been reached. I think it is necessary, first, to remind you of a few events which have taken place. You remember, men of Athens, that two or three years ago, the news came that Philip was in Thrace, besieging the Heraion Teikos. That was in the month of November. Amidst all the discussion and commotion which took place in this assembly, you passed a resolution that 40 warships should be launched, that men under 45 years of age should embark in person, and that we should pay a war tax of 60 talents. That year came to an end, and there followed July. August, September. In the latter month, after the mysteries, and with reluctance, you dispatched Charidimus with ten ships carrying no soldiers and five talents of silver. For so soon as news had come that Philip was sick or dead, both reports were brought. You dismissed the armament, men of Athens, thinking that there was no longer any occasion for the expedition. But it was the very occasion, for had we then gone to the scene of action, with the same enthusiasm which marked our resolution to do so, Philip would not have been preserved to trouble us today. What was done then cannot be altered, but now a critical moment in another campaign has arrived, and it is in view of this, and to prevent you from falling into the same error, that I have recalled these facts. How then shall we use this opportunity, men of Athens? For unless you will go to the rescue with might and main to the utmost of your power, mark how in every respect you will have served Philip's interest by your conduct of the war. At the outset, the Olynthians possessed considerable strength, and such was the position of affairs, that neither did Philip feel safe against them, nor they against Philip. We made peace with them, and they with us. It was as if it were a stumbling block in Philip's path, and an annoyance to him, that a great city, which had made a compact with us, should sit watching for any opportunity he might offer. We thought that we ought to excite him to war with him by every means, and now this much-talked-of event has come to pass. By what means, I need not relate. What course then is open to us, men of Athens, but to go to their aid resolutely and eagerly? I can see none. 
apart from the shame in which we should be involved, if we let anything be lost through our negligence, I can see, men of Athens, that the subsequent prospect would be alarming in no small degree. When the attitude of the Thebans towards us is what it is, when the funds of the Phocians are exhausted, and when there is no one to prevent Philip, so soon as he has made himself master of all that at present occupies him, from bringing his energies to bear upon the situation further south. But if any of you is putting off until then his determination to do his duty, he must be desirous of seeking the terrors of war close at hand, when he need only hear of them at a distance, and of seeking helpers for himself, when now he can give help to others. For that this is what it must come to. If we sacrifice the present opportunity, we must all, I think, be fairly aware. But, someone may say, we have all made up our minds that we must go to their aid, and we will go. Only tell us how we are to do it. Now, do not be surprised, men of Athens, if I give an answer which will be astonishing to most of you. You must appoint a legislative commission, but when the commissioners meet, you must not enact a single law. You have laws enough. You must cancel the laws which, in view of present circumstances, are injurious to you. I mean the laws which deal with the festival fund. To put it quite plainly, and some of those which deal with military service. For the former distribute your funds as festival money to those who remain at home, or the latter give immunity to malingerers, and thereby also take the heart out of those who want to do their duty. When you have canceled these laws and made the path safe for one who would give the best advice, then you can look for someone to propose what you all know to be expedient. But until you have done this, you must not expect to find a man who will be glad to advise you for the best, and be ruined by you for his pains, for you will find no one, particularly when the only result will be that some unjust punishment will be inflicted on the proposer or mover of such measures, and that instead of helping matters at all, he will have only made it even more dangerous in future than it is at present present to give you the best advice. Aye, and you should require the repeal of these laws, men of Athens, from the very persons who proposed them. It is not fair that those who originally proposed them should enjoy the popularity which was fraught with such mischief to the whole state, and that the unpopularity, which would lead to an improvement in the condition of us all, should be visited to his cost upon one who now advises you for the best. Until you have thus prepared the way, men of Athens, you must entertain no expectation whatever that anyone will be influential enough here to transgress these laws with impunity, or senseless enough to fling himself to certain ruin. At the same time, men of Athens, you must not fail to realize this further point. No resolution is worth anything without the willingness to perform at least what you have resolved, and that heartily. For if decrees by themselves could either compel you to do what you ought, or could realize their several objects unaided, you would not be decreeing many things and performing few, nay, none, of the things that you decree, nor would Philip have insulted you so long. If decrees could have done it, he would have paid the penalty long ago, but it is not so. Actions come later than speeches and voting in order of procedure, but in effectiveness they are before either and stronger than either. It is action that is still needed, all else you already have. For you have those among you, men of Athens, who can tell you what your duty is, and no one is quicker than you are to understand the speaker's bidding. I and you will be able to carry it out even now if you act aright. What time, what opportunity do you look for better than the present? When, if not now, will you do your duty? Has not the man seized every position from us already? If he becomes master of this country too, will not our fate be the most shameful in the world? 
and the men who we promised to be ready to save, if they went to war, are they not now at war? Is he not our enemy? Are not our possessions in his hands? Is he not a barbarian? Is he not anything that you choose to call him? In God's name, when we have let everything go, when we have all but put everything into his hands, shall we then inquire at large who is responsible for it all? That we shall never admit our own responsibility, I am perfectly sure. Just so, amid the perils of war, none of those who have run away accuses himself. He accuses his general, his neighbor, anyone but himself. And yet, I suppose, all who have run away have helped to cause the defeat. He who now blames the rest might have stood fast, and if everyone had done so, the victory would have been theirs. And so now, if a particular speaker's advice is not the best, let another rise and make a proposal, instead of blaming him. And if some other has better advice to give, carry it out, and good fortune be with you. What? Is the advice disagreeable? That is no longer the speaker's fault, unless, of course, he leaves out the prayer that you expect of him. There is no difficulty in the prayer, men of Athens. A man need only compress all his desires into a short sentence. But to make his choice, when the question for discussion is one of practical policy, is by no means equally easy. Then a man is bound to choose what is best, instead of what is pleasant, if both are not possible at once. But suppose that someone is able, without touching the festival fund, to suggest other sources of supply for military purposes. Is not he the better advisor? Certainly, men of Athens, if such a thing is possible. But I should be surprised if it ever has happened, or ever should happen, to anyone to find, after spending what he has upon wrong objects, that what he has not is wealth enough to enable him to effect right ones. Such arguments as these find, I think, their great support in each man's personal desire, and for that reason, nothing is easier than to deceive oneself. What a man desires, he actually fancies to be true. But the reality often follows no such principle. Consider the matter, therefore, men of Athens, after this fashion. Consider in what ways our objects can be realized under the circumstances, and in what way you will be able to make the expedition and to receive your pay. Surely it is not like sober or high-minded men to submit light-heartedly to the reproach which must follow upon any shortcomings in the operations of the war through want of funds, to seize your weapons and march against the Corinthians and Megarians and then to allow Philip to enslave Hellenic cities, because you cannot find rations for your troops. These words do not spring from a wanton determination to court the ill will of any party among you. I am neither so foolish nor so unfortunate as to desire unpopularity when I do not believe that I am doing any good. But a loyal citizen ought, in my judgment, to care more for the safety of his country's fortunes than for the popularity of his utterances. Such I have heard, and perhaps you have heard it also, was the principle which the orators of our forefathers' time habitually followed in public life. Those orators who are praised by all who rise to address you, though they are far from intimidating them, the great Aristides, and Nicias, and my own namesake, and Pericles. But ever since these speakers have appeared who are always asking you, what would you like? What may I propose for you? What can I do to please you? The interests of the city have been wantonly given away for the sake of the pleasure and gratification of the moment, and we see that the consequences, the fortunes of the speakers prosper, while your own are in a shameful plight. And yet consider, men of Athens, the main characteristics of the achievements of your forefathers' time and those of your own. The description will be brief and familiar to you, for you need not have recourse to the history of others 
when your own will furnish examples, by following which you may achieve prosperity. Our forefathers, who were not courted and caressed by their politicians as you are by these persons today, were leaders of the Hellenes. With their good will, for 45 years, they brought up into the Acropolis more than 10,000 talents. The king who then ruled Macedonia obeyed them as a foreigner ought to obey a Hellenic people. Serving in person, they set up many glorious trophies for victories by land and sea, and alone of all mankind, they left behind them, as the crown of their exploits, a fame that is beyond the reach of envy. Such was the part they played in the Hellenic world, and now contemplate the manner of men they were in the city, both in public and in private life. As public men, they gave us buildings and objects of such beauty and grandeur, and the temples which they built and the offerings which they dedicated in them, that no room has been left for any of those that come after to surpass them. While in private life, they were so modest, 26, so intensely loyal to the spirit of the Constitution, that if anyone actually knows what the house of Aristides or Miliates or any of the other glorious men of that day is like, he can see that it is no more imposing than those of their neighbors. For it was not to win a fortune that they undertook affairs of the state, but each thought it is his duty to add to the common weal, and thus, acting in a spirit of good faith towards the Hellenes, of piety towards the gods, and of equality towards one another, they naturally attained great prosperity. Such was the national life of those times, when those whom I have mentioned were the foremost men in the state. How do matters stand today, thanks to these worthy persons? Is there any likeness, any resemblance to old times? Thanks to them, and though I might say much, I pass over all but this. When we had the field, as you see, completely open to us, when the Spartans had been ruined, and the Thebans had their hands full, and no other power could seriously dispute the supremacy with us on the field of battle, when we could have retained our own possessions in safety, and have stood as umpires of the rights of others, we have been deprived of our own territory. We have spent more than 1,500 talents to no good purpose. The allies whom we had gained in the war, these persons have lost in time of peace, and we have trained Philip to be the powerful enemy to us that he is. Let anyone rise and tell me how Philip has grown so strong, if we ourselves are not the source of his strength. But, my good sir, you say, if we are badly off in these respects, we are at any rate better off at home. And where is the proof of this? Is it in the whitewashing of the battlements, the mending of the roads, the fountains, and all such trumperies? Look then at the men whose policy gives you these things. Some of them who were poor have become rich. Others who were unknown to fame have risen to honor. Some of them have provided themselves with private houses more imposing than our public buildings, and the lower the fortunes of the city have fallen, the higher theirs have risen. What is the cause of all these things? Why is it that all was well then and all is amiss today? It is because then the people itself dared to act and to serve in the army. And so the people was master of its politicians. All patronage was in its own hands. Any separate individual was content to receive from the people his share of honor or office or other emolument. The reverse is now the case. All patronage is in the hands of politicians. While you, the people, emasculated, stripped of money and allies, have been reduced to the position of servile supernumeraries, content if they give you distributions of festival money, or organize a procession at the Bodroma. And to crown all this bravery, you are expected also to thank them for giving you what is your own. 
They pen you up closely in the city. They entice you to these delights. They tame you till you come to their hand. But a high and generous spirit can never, I believe, be acquired by men whose actions are mean and poor. For such as a man's practice is, such might his spirit be. And in all solemnity, I should not be surprised if I suffered greater harm at your hands for telling you the things that I have told you than the men who have brought them to pass. Even freedom of speech is not possible on all subjects in this place, and I wonder that it has been granted to me today. If even now you will rid yourselves of these habits, if you will resolve to join the forces and to act worthily of yourselves, converting the superfluities which you enjoy at home into resources to secure our advantage abroad, then it may be, men of Athens, it may be that you will gain some great and final good, and will be rid of these your perquisites, which are like the diet that a physician gives a sick man, diet which neither puts strength into him nor lets him die. For these sums which you now share among yourselves are neither large enough to give you any adequate assistance, nor small enough to let you renounce them and go about your business. But these it is that increase the indolence of every individual among you. Is it then paid service that you suggest? Some will ask. I do, men of Athens, and a system for immediate enforcement which will embrace all alike, so that each, while receiving his share of the public funds, may supply whatever service the state requires of him. If we can remain at peace, then he will do better to stay at home, free from the necessity of doing anything discreditable through poverty. But if a situation like the present occurs, then supported by these same sons, he will serve loyally in person, in defense of his country. If a man is outside the military age, then let him take in his place among the rest, that which he now receives irregularly and without doing any service. And let him act as an overseer and manager of business that must be done. In short, without adding or subtracting anything beyond a small sum, and only removing the want of system, my plan reduces the state to order, making your receipt of payment, your service in the army or courts, and your performance of any duty which the age of each of you allows, and the occasion requires, all part of one and the same system. But it has been no part of my proposal that we should assign the due of those to, who act to those who do nothing that we should idle ourselves and enjoy our leisure helplessly, listening to the tales of victories won by somebody's mercenaries. For this is what happens now. Not that I blame one who is doing some part of your duty for you, but I require you to do for yourselves the things which you honor others, and not to abandon the position which your fathers won through many a glorious peril and bequeathed to you. I think I have told you all that in my belief your interest demands. May you choose the course which will be for the good of the city and of you all. End of section 7. Recording by Devin Tatlow. Section 8 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Peace. After the fall of Olynthus in 348, the Athenians, on the proposal of Eubulus, sent embassies to the Greek states in the Peloponnese and elsewhere to invite them to join in a coalition against Philip. Aeschines went for this purpose to Megalopolis, and did his best to counteract Philip's influence in Arcadia. When the embassies proved unsuccessful, 
became clear that peace must be made on such terms as were possible. Philip himself was anxious for peace, since he wished to cross the pass of Thermopylae without such opposition from Athens as he had encountered in 352, and to be free from the attacks of hostile ships upon his ports. Even before the fall of Olynthus, informal communications passed between himself and Athens, and in consequence of these, Philocrates proposed and the assembly passed a decree under which ten ambassadors were appointed to go to Philip and invite him to send plenipotentiaries to Athens to conclude a peace. Demosthenes, who had strongly supported Philocrates, was among the ten, as well as Ischines and Philocrates himself. Delighted with Philip's reception of them, and greatly attracted by his personality, the ambassadors returned with a letter from him, promising in general terms to confer great benefits upon Athens, if he were granted alliance as well as peace. In the meantime, he undertook not to interfere with the towns allied to Athens and the Chersonese. Demosthenes proposed, in the council, of which he was a member in the year 347 to 346, the usual complimentary resolution in honor of the ambassadors, and on his motion it was resolved to hold two meetings of the assembly, on the 18th and the 19th of the month Alaphibolian, probably just after the middle of April 346, when Philip's envoys would have arrived to discuss the terms of peace. The envoys, Antipater, Parmenio, and Eurylochus, reached Athens shortly after this, and before the first of the two meetings was held, the Synod of the Allies of Athens, now assembled in the city, agreed to peace on such terms as the Athenian people should decide, but added a proposal that it should be permitted to any Greek state to become a party to the peace within three months. They said nothing of alliance. Of the two meetings of the assembly, in view of the conflicting statements of Demosthenes and Aeschines, only a probable account can be given. At the first, Philocrates proposed that alliance as well as peace should be made by Athens and her allies with Philip and his allies, on the understanding that both parties should keep what they de facto possessed, a provision entailing the renunciation by Athens of Amphipolis and Potidaea, but that the Phocians and the people of Halys should be excluded. Aeschines opposed this strongly, and both he and Demosthenes claimed to support the resolution of the allies, which would have given the excluded peoples a chance of sharing the advantage of the peace. The feeling of the assembly was with them. Although the Phocians had recently insulted the Athenians, by declining to give up to Proxenus, the Athenian admiral, the towns guarding the approaches to Thermopylae, which they themselves had offered to place in the hands of Athens. But Philocrates obtained the postponement of the decision till the next day. On the next day, if not before, it became plain that Philip's envoys would not consent to forgo the exclusion of the Phocians and Halus, in order that the assembly might be induced to pass the resolution, the clause expressly excluding them was dropped and peace and alliance were made between Athens and Philip, each with their allies. Even this was not secured before Aeschines and his friends had deprecated rash attempts to imitate the exploits of antiquity by continuing the war, and had explained that Philip could not openly accept the Phocians as allies, but that when the peace was concluded, he would satisfy all the wishes of the Athenians in every way. While Eubulus threatened the people with immediate war, involving personal service and heavy taxation, unless they accepted Philocrates' decree. A few days afterwards, the Athenians and the representatives of the Allies took the oath to observe the peace. Nothing was said about the Phocians and Halus. Sarsopleptus's representative was probably not permitted to swear with the rest. The same ten ambassadors as before were instructed to receive Philip's oath, and the oaths of his allies, to arrange for the ransom of prisoners, and generally to treat Philip in the interests of Athens. Demosthenes urged his colleagues, and obtained an instruction from the council to this effect, to sail at once, in order that Philip, who was now in Thrace, might not make conquests at the expense of Athens before ratifying the peace. But they delayed at Oreus, went by land and set up under the escort of Proxenus by sea, and only reached Pella, the Macedonian capital, twenty-three days after leaving Athens. Philip did not arrive for twenty-seven days more. By this time he had taken Sersobleptus prisoner, and captured Syrium, Periscus, and other Thracian towns, which were held by Athenian troops sent to assist Sersobleptus. Demosthenes was now openly at variance with his colleagues. He had no doubt realized the necessity of peace, but probably regarded the exclusion of the Phocians as unwarrantable, and thought the policy of his colleagues must end in Philip's conquest of all of Greece. At Pella he occupied himself in negotiations for the ransom of prisoners. After taking the oath, Philip kept the ambassadors with him until he had made all preparations for his march southward, and during this time he played with them and with the envoys from the other Greek states who were present at the same time. His intention of marching to Thermopylae was clear, but he seems to have led all alike to suppose that he would fulfill their particular wishes when he had crossed the pass. The ambassadors accompanied him to Phere, where the oath was taken by the representatives of Philip's allies, the Phocians, Halus, and Sersobleptus were excluded from the peace. 
Halus was taken by Philip's army shortly afterwards. The ambassadors of Athens then returned homewards, bearing a letter from Philip, but did not arrive at Athens before Philip had reached Thermopylae. On their return, Demosthenes denounced them before the council, which refused them the customary compliments, and, on Demosthenes' motion, determined to propose to the people that Proxenus with his squadron should be ordered to go to the aid of the Phocians and to prevent Philip from crossing the pass. When the assembly met on the 16th of Syrophorion, shortly before the middle of July, Aeschines rose first, and announced in glowing terms the intention of Philip to turn round upon Thebes and to re-establish Thespiae and Plataeae, and hinted at the restoration to Athens of Euboea and Oropus. Then Philip's letter was read, containing no promises, but excusing the delay of the ambassadors as due to his own request. The assembly was elated at the promises announced by Aeschines, Demosthenes' attempt to contradict the announcement failed, and on Philocrates' motion it was resolved to extend the peace and alliance with Philip to posterity, and to declare that if the Phocians refused to surrender the Temple of Delphi to the Amphictyons, Athens would take steps against those responsible for the refusal. Demosthenes refused to serve on the embassy appointed to convey this resolution to Philip. Aeschines was appointed, but was too ill to start. The ambassadors set out, but within a few days returned with the news that the Phocian army had surrendered to Philip, its leader, Philesus, and his troops being allowed to depart to the Peloponnese. The surrender had perhaps been accelerated by the news of the Athenian resolution. The assembly, in alarm lest Philip should march southwards, now resolved to take measures of precaution and defense, and to send the same ambassadors to Philip to do what they could. They went, Aeschines among them, and arrived in the midst of the festivities with which Philip was celebrating the success of his plans. The invitation which Philip sent to Athens to send a force to join his own and to assist in settling the affairs of Phocis was, on Demosthenes' advice, declined by the assembly, and soon afterwards another letter from Philip expressed surprise at the unfriendly attitude taken up by the Athenians towards him. Philip next summoned the Amphictyonic Council, the legitimate guardians of the Delphian Temple, on whose behalf the Thebans and the Thessalians, aided by Philip, were now at war with the Phocians, and the council, in the absence of many of its members, resolved to transfer the votes of the Phocians in the council meeting to Philip, to break up the Phocian towns into villages, disarming their inhabitants and taking away their horses, to require them to repay the stolen treasure to the temple by installments, and to pronounce a curse upon those actually guilty of sacrilege, which would render them liable to arrest anywhere. The destructive part of the sentence was rigorously executed by the Thebans. In order to punish the former supporters of the Phocians, the right to precedence in consulting the oracle was transferred from Athens to Philip by order of the council, and the Spartans were excluded from the temple. Orchomenus and Coronea were destroyed, and their inhabitants enslaved, and Thebes became absolute mistress of all of Boeotia. The Pythian Games at Delphi in September 346 were celebrated under Philip's presidency, but both Sparta and Athens refused to send the customary deputation to them, and Philip accordingly sent envoys to Athens, along with representatives of the Amphictyons, to demand recognition for himself as an Amphictyonic power. Aeschines supported the demand, his argument being apparently to the effect that Philip had been forced to act as he had done by the Thebans and the Thessalians, but the assembly was very angry at the results, as they seemed to be, of Aeschines' diplomacy and the calamities of the Phocians. And it was only when Demosthenes, in the speech on the peace, advised compliance that they were persuaded to give way. To have refused would have brought the united forces of the Amphictyonic states against Athens, and these she could not have resisted. It was therefore prudent to keep the peace, though Demosthenes evidently regarded it as only an armistice. I see, men of Athens, that our present situation is one of great perplexity and confusion, for not only have many of our interests been sacrificed, that is, of no use to make eloquent speeches about them, but even as regards what still remains to us, there is no general agreement in any single point as to what is expedient. Some hold one view, and some another. Perplexing, moreover, and difficult as deliberation naturally is, men of Athens, you have made it far more difficult. For while all the rest of mankind are in the habit of resorting to deliberation before the event, you do not do so until afterwards and consequently, during the whole time that falls within my memory, however high a reputation for eloquence one who upbraids you for all your errors may enjoy, the desired results and the objects of your deliberation pass out of your grasp. And yet I believe, and it is because I have convinced myself of this that I have arisen, that if you resolve to abandon all clamor and contention, as becomes men who are deliberating on behalf of their country upon so great an issue, I shall be able to describe and recommend measures to you, by which the solution may be improved, and what you have sacrificed, recovered. Now, although I know perfectly well, men of Athens, that to speak to you about one's own earlier speeches, and about oneself, is a practice which is always extremely repaying, 
I feel the vulgarity and offensiveness of it so strongly that I shrink from it even when I see that it is necessary. I think, however, that you will form a better judgment on the subject on which I am about to speak if I remind you of some of the things that I have said on certain previous occasions. In the first place, men of Athens, when at the time of the disturbance in Euboea you were being urged to assist Plutarchus and to undertake an inglorious and costly campaign, I came forward first and unsupported to oppose this action, and was almost torn to pieces by those who for the sake of their own petty profits had induced you to commit many grave errors, and when only a short time had elapsed, along with the shame that which you incurred in the treatment which you received, treatment such as no people in the world ever before experienced at the hands of those whom they went to assist, there came the recognition by all of you of the bareness of those who had urged you to this course, and of the excellence of my own advice. Again, men of Athens, I observe that Neoptolemus, the actor, who was allowed freedom of movement everywhere on the ground of his profession, and was doing the city the greatest mischief, was managing and directing your communications with Philip in Philip's own interest. And I came forward and informed you, and that, not to gratify any private dislike or desire to misrepresent him, as subsequent events have made plain. And in this case I shall not, as before, throw the blame on any speakers or defenders of Neoptolemus. Indeed, he had no defenders. It is yourselves that I blame. For had you been watching rival tragedies in the theatre, instead of discussing the vital interests of a whole state, you could not have listened with more partiality towards him, or more prejudice against me. And yet, I believe, you have all now realized that though, according to his own assertion, this visit to the enemy's country was paid in order that he may get in the debts owing to him there, and return with funds to perform his public service here, though he was always repeating the same statement that it was monstrous to accuse those who were transferring their means from Macedonia to Athens, yet, when the peace had removed all danger, he converted his real estate here into money, and took himself off with it to Philip. These, then, are two events which I have foretold, events which because their real character was exactly and faithfully disclosed by me are testimony to the speeches which i have delivered a third men of athens was the following and when i have given you this one instance i will immediately proceed to the subject on which i have come forward to speak when we returned from the embassy after receiving from philip his oath to maintain the peace there were some who promised that thespiae and platiae would be repeopled and said that if philip became the master of the situation he would save the phocians and would break up the city of thebes into villages that Oropus would be yours, and that Euboea would be restored to you in place of Amphipolis, with other hopes and deceptions of the same kind, by which you were seduced into sacrificing the Phocians in a manner that was contrary to your interest and perhaps to your honor also. But as for me, you will find that neither had I any share in this deception, nor yet did I hold my peace. On the contrary, I warned you plainly, as I know you remember, that I had no knowledge and no expectations of this kind, and that I regarded such statements as nonsense." All these plain instances of superior foresight on my part, men of Athens, I shall not describe to any cleverness, any boasted merits of my own. I will not pretend that my foreknowledge and discernment are due to any causes but such as I will name, and they are too. The first, men of Athens, is that good fortune, which, I observe, is more powerful than all the cleverness and wisdom on earth. The second is the fact that my judgment and reasoning are disinterested. No one can point to any personal gain in connection with my public acts and words, and therefore I see what is to our interest undistorted, in the light in which the actual facts reveal it. But when you throw money into one scale of the balance, its weight carries everything with it, your judgment is instantly dragged down with it, and one who has acted so can no longer think soundly or healthily about anything. Now there is one primary condition which must be observed by anyone who would furnish the city with allies or contributions or anything else. He must do it without breaking the existing peace not because the piece is at all admirable or creditable to you, but because, whatever its character, it would have been better, in the actual circumstances, that it should never have been made, than that having been made, it should now be broken through our action. For we have sacrificed many advantages which we possessed when we made it, and which would have rendered the war safer and easier for us than it is now. The second condition, men of Athens, is that we shall not draw on these self-styled amphictyons, who are now assembled, until they have an irresistible or a plausible reason for making a united war against us. My own belief is that if war broke out again between ourselves and Philip about Amphipolis or any such claim of our own, in which the Thessalians and Argives and Thebans have no interest, none of these peoples would go to war against us. Least of all, and let no one raise a clamor before he hears what I have to say, least of all, the Thebans, not because they are in any pleasant mood towards us, not because they would be glad to gratify Philip, but because they know perfectly well, however stupid one might think them, that if war springs up between themselves and you, 
They will get all of the hardships of war for their share, while another will sit by, waiting to secure all the advantages, and they are not likely to sacrifice themselves for such a prospect, unless the origin and the cause of the war are such as concern all alike. Nor again should we, in my opinion, suffer at all, if we went to war with Thebes on account of Arupus or any other purely Athenian interest. For I believe that while those who would assist ourselves or the Thebans would give their aid if their allies' own country were invaded, they would not join either in an offensive campaign, for this is the manner of alliances, such, at least, as are worth considering, and the relationship is naturally of this kind. The good will of each ally, whether it be towards ourselves or towards the Thebans, does not imply the same interest in our conquest of others as in our existence. Our continued existence they would all desire for their own sakes, but none of them would wish that through conquest either of us should become their own masters. What is it then that I regard with apprehension? What is it that we must guard against? I fear lest a common pretext should be supplied for the coming war, a common charge against us, which will appeal to all alike. For if the Argives and the Mycenaeans and the Megalopolitans, and some of the other Peloponnesians who are in sympathy with them, adopt a hostile attitude towards us owing to our negotiations for peace with Sparta, and the belief that to some extent we are giving our approval to the policy which the Spartans have pursued, the Thebans already, as we are told, detest us, and are sure to become even more hostile, because we are harboring those whom they have exiled, and losing no opportunity of displaying our ill will towards them, and the Thessalians, because we are offering a refuge to the Phocian fugitives, and Philip because we were preventing his admission to the Amphictyonic rank. My fear, when each power has thus its separate reasons for resentment, they may unite in the war against us, with the decrees of the Amphictyons for their pretext, and so each may be drawn on farther than their several interests would carry them, just as they were in dealing with the Phocians. For you doubtless realize that it was not through any unity in their respective ambitions that the Thebans and Philip and the Thessalians all acted together just now. The Thebans, for instance, could not prevent Philip from marching through and occupying the passes, nor even from stepping in at the last moment to reap the credit of all that they themselves had toiled for. For as it is, though the Thebans have gained something so far as the recovery of their territory is concerned, their honor and reputation have suffered shamefully, since it now appears as though they would have gained nothing unless Philip had crossed the pass. This was not what they intended. They only submitted to all this in their anxiety to obtain Orchomenus and Coronea, and their inability to do so otherwise. And as to Philip, some persons, as you know, are bold enough to say that it was not from any wish to do so that he handed over Orchomenus and Coronea to Thebes, but from compulsion. And although I must part company with them there, I am sure that at least he did not want to do this more than he desired to occupy the passes, and to get credit of appearing to have determined the issue of the war, and to manage the Pythian gains by his own authority. These, I am sure, were the objects which he coveted most greedily. The Thessalians, again, did not desire to see either the Thebans or Philip growing powerful, for in any such contingency they thought that they themselves were menaced. But they did desire to secure two privileges, admission to the Amphictyonic meeting and the recovery of rights at Delphi, and in their eagerness for these privileges they joined Philip in the actions in question. Thus you find that each was led on, for the sake of private ends, to take action which they in no way desired to take but this is the very thing against which we now have to be on our guard. Are we then, for fear of this, to submit to Philip, and do you require this of us, you ask me? Far from it. Our action must be such as will be in no way unworthy of us, and at the same time will not lead to war, but will prove to all our good sense and the justice of our position. And in answer to those who are bold enough to think that we should refuse to submit to anything whatever, and who cannot foresee the war that must follow, I wish to urge this consideration. We are allowing the Thebans to hold Europus, and if anyone asked us to state the reason honestly, we should say that it was to avoid war. Again, we have just ceded Amphipolis to Philip by the Treaty of Peace. We permit the Cardians to occupy a position apart from the other colonists and the Chersonese. We allow the Prince of Korea to see the islands of Chios, Kos, and Rhodes, and the Byzantines to drive our vessels to shore. Obviously because we believe the tranquility afforded by peace brings more blessings than any collision or contention over these grievances would bring. So it would be a foolish and utterly perverse policy when we had behaved in this manner towards each of our adversaries individually, where our own most essential interests were concerned, to go now to war with all of them together, on account of the shadow at Delphi. End of section 8. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 9 of The Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Manalakis. 
The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. The Second Philippic. Introduction. After settling affairs at Delphi in 346, Philip returned to Macedonia. During a considerable part of 345 and the early months of 344, he was occupied with campaigns against the Illyrians, Dardani, and Triballi. But in the summer, probably, of 344, he resumed his activities in Greece, garrisoning Phere and other towns of Thessaly with Macedonians, appropriating the revenues derived from the Thessalian ports, and establishing oligarchical governments throughout the country. At the same time, negotiations were going on between himself and Athens with regard to the Thracian strongholds which he had captured in 346. He refused to give these up, though he offered to cut a canal across the Chersonese for the protection of the Athenian allies there from the attacks of the Thracians. He also sent money and mercenaries to help the Mycenaeans and Argives, who, like the Megalopolitans, were anxious to secure their independence of Sparta. Athens, which was on friendly terms with Sparta, sent envoys from the Peloponnesian states to counteract Philip's influence, and of these Demosthenes was one. In return, Argos and Messini complained to Athens of her interference with their attempt to secure freedom, and Philip sent envoys to deprecate the charges made against him by the Athenian ambassadors in the Peloponnese. He pointed out that he had not broken any promises made to Athens at the time of the peace, for he had made none. In fact, if Demosthenes' account is correct, he had confined himself to vague expressions of goodwill. The promises had been made by Eschines. The second Philippic, spoken late in 344, proposes a reply to Philip, the text of which has unfortunately not come down to us. The Peloponnesian envoys appear also to have been in Athens at the time, and Philip's supporters had put forward various explanations of his conduct at the time when the peace was made. To these also Demosthenes replies. In all our discussions, men of Athens, with regard to the acts of violence by which Philip contravenes the terms of the peace, I observe that, although the speeches on our side are always manifestly just and sympathetic, and although those who denounce Philip are always regarded as saying what ought to be said, yet practically nothing is done which ought to be done, or which would make it worthwhile to listen to such speeches. On the contrary, the condition of public affairs as a whole has already been brought to a point at which, the more and the more evidently a speaker can convict Philip both of transgressing the peace which he made with you and of plotting against all the Hellenes, the harder it is for him to advise you how you should act. The responsibility for this rests with us all, men of Athens. It is by deeds and actions, not by words, that a policy of encroachment must be arrested. And yet, in the first place, we who rise to address you will not face the duty of proposing or advising such action, for fear of unpopularity with you, though we dilate upon the character of Philip's acts, upon their atrocity, and so forth. And in the second place, you who sit and listen, better qualified though you doubtless are than Philip, for using the language of justice and appreciating it at the mouths of others, are nevertheless absolutely inert when it is a question of preventing him from executing the designs in which he is now engaged. It follows as the inevitable and perhaps reasonable consequence that you are each more successful in that to which your time and your interest is given, he in actions, yourselves in words. Now, if it is still enough for you that your words are more just than his, your course is easy and no labor is involved in it. But if we are to inquire how the evil of the present situation is to be corrected, if its advance is not still to continue, unperceived, until we are confronted by a power so great that we cannot even raise a hand in our own defense, then we must alter our method of deliberation. And all of us who speak, and all of you who listen, must resolve to prefer the counsels which are best, and which can save us to those which are most easy and most attractive. I am amazed, men of Athens, in the first place, that anyone who sees the present greatness of Philip and the wide mastery which he has gained can be free from alarm, 
or can imagine that this involves no peril to Athens, or that it is not against you that all his preparations are being made. And I would beg you, one and all, to listen while I put before you in a few words the reasoning by which I have come to entertain the opposite expectation, and the grounds upon which I regard Philip as an enemy. That so, if my own foresight appears to you the truer, you may believe me. But if that of the persons who have no fears and have placed their trust in him, you may give your adhesion to them. Here, then, men of Athens, is my argument. Of what, in the first place, did Philip become master when the peace was concluded? Of Thermopylae, and of the situation in Phocis. Next, what use did he make of his power? He deliberately chose to act in the interests of Thebes, not in those of Athens. And why? He scrutinized every consideration in the light of his own ambition, and of his desire for universal conquest. He took no thought for peace, or tranquility, or justice. And he saw quite correctly that our state and our national character being what they are, there was no attraction that he could offer, nothing that he could do which would induce you to sacrifice any of the other Hellenes to him for your own advantage. He saw that you would take account of what was right, that you would shrink from the infamy attaching to such a policy, that you would exercise all the foresight which the situation demanded, and would oppose any such attempt on his part as surely as if you were at open war with him. But the Thebans, he believed, and the event proved that he was right, in return for what they were getting would let him do as he pleased in all that did not concern them, and far from acting against him or preventing him effectively, would even join him in his campaign if he bade them. His services to the Messenians and the Argives at the present moment are due to his having formed the same conception of them. And this, men of Athens, is the highest of all tributes to yourselves, for these actions of his amount to a verdict upon you, that you alone of all peoples would never, for any gain to yourselves, sacrifice the common rights of the Hellenes, nor barter away your loyalty to them for any favor or benefit at his hands. This conception of you he has naturally formed, just as he has formed the opposite conception of the Argives and the Thebans, not only from his observation of the present, but also his consideration of the past. He discovers, I imagine, and is told how when your forefathers might have been rulers of the rest of the Hellenes, on condition of submitting to the king themselves, they not only refused to tolerate the suggestion on the occasion when Alexander, the ancestor of the present royal house, came as his herald to negotiate, but chose rather to leave their country and to face any suffering which they might have to endure, and how they followed up the refusal by those deeds which are all so eager to tell, but to which no one has ever been able to do justice. And for that reason I shall myself forbear to speak of them, and rightly, for the grandeur of their achievements passes the power of language to describe. He knows, on the other hand, how the forefathers of the Thebans and Argives, in the one case, joined the barbarian army, in the other, offered no resistance to it. He knows, therefore, that both these peoples will welcome what is to their own advantage, instead of considering the common interests of the Hellenes, and so he thought that, if he chose you for his allies, he would be choosing friends who would only serve a righteous cause, while if he joined himself to them, he would win accomplices who would further his own ambitions. That is why he chose them, as he chooses them now, in preference to you. For he certainly does not see them in possession of more ships than you, nor has he discovered some inland empire and withdrawn from the seaboard and the trading ports, nor does he forget the words and the promises on the strength of which he was granted the peace. But someone may tell us, with an air of complete knowledge of the matter, that what then moved Philip to act thus was not his ambition or any of the motives which I impute to him, but his belief that the demands of Thebes were more righteous than your own. I reply that this statement, above all others, is one which he cannot possibly make now. How can one who is ordering Sparta to give up Messina put forward his belief in the righteousness of the act as his excuse for handing over Orchomenus and Coronia to Thebes? But, we are told, as their last remaining plea, he was forced to make these concessions, and did so against his better judgment, finding himself caught between the cavalry of Thessaly and the infantry of Thebes. 
admirable. And so we are informed he intends henceforth to be wary of the Thebans. And the tale goes round that he intends to fortify Elatea. Intends, indeed, and I expect that it will remain an intention. But the help which he has given to the Messenians and Argives is no intention, for he is actually sending mercenaries to them and dispatching funds, and is himself expected to arrive on the spot with a great force. Is he trying to annihilate the Spartans, the existing enemies of Thebes, and at the same time protecting the Phocians, whom he himself has ruined? Who will believe such a tale? For if Philip had really acted against his will and under compulsion in the first instance, if he were now really intending to renounce the Thebans, I cannot believe that he would be so consistently opposing their enemies. On the contrary, his present course plainly proves that his former action also was the result of deliberate policy. And to any sound observation, it is plain that the whole of his plans are being organized for one end, the destruction of Athens. Indeed, this has now come to be, in a sense, a matter of necessity for him. Only consider, it is empire that he desires, and you, as he believes, are his only possible rivals in this. He has been acting wrongfully towards you for a long time, as he himself best knows, for it is the occupation of your possessions that enables him to hold all his other conquests securely, convinced as he is that if he had let Amphipolis and Potidea go, he could not dwell in safety even at home. These two facts, then, he well knows. First, that his designs are aimed at you, and secondly, that you are aware of it, and as he conceives you to be men of sense, he considers that you hold him in righteous detestation, and in consequence his energies are roused, for he expects to suffer disaster, if you get your opportunity, unless he can anticipate you by inflicting it upon you. So, he is wide awake. He is on the alert. He is courting the help of others against Athens, of the Thebans and those Peloponnesians who sympathize with their wishes, thinking that their desire of gain will make them embrace the immediate prospect, while their native stupidity will prevent them from foreseeing any of the consequences. Yet there are examples plainly visible to minds which are even moderately well balanced, Examples which it fell to my lot to bring before Messenian and Argive audiences, but which had better perhaps be laid before yourselves as well. Can you not imagine, I said, men of Messenia, the impatience with which the Olynthians used to listen to any speeches directed against Philip in those times, when he was giving up Anthemus to them, a city claimed as their own by all former Macedonian kings, when he was expelling the Athenian colonists from Potidea and presenting it to the Olynthians, when he had taken upon his own shoulders their quarrel with Athens and given them the enjoyment of that territory. Did they expect, do you think, to suffer as they have done? If anyone had foretold it, would they have believed him? And yet, I continued, after enjoying territory, not their own for a very short time, they are robbed of their own by him for a great while to come. They are foully driven forth, not conquered merely, but betrayed by one another and sold. For it is not safe for a free state to be on these overfriendly terms with a tyrant. What again of the Thessalians? Do you imagine, I asked, that when he was expelling their tyrants, or again when he was giving them Nicaea and Magnesia, they expected to see their present council of ten established in their midst? Did they expect that the restorer of their Amphicytonic rights would take their own revenues from them for himself? Impossible. And yet these things came to pass, as all men may know. You yourselves, I continued, at present behold only the gifts and the promises of Philip. Pray, if you are really in your right minds, that you may never see the accomplishment of his deceit and treachery. There are, as you know well, I said, all kinds of inventions designed for the protection and security of cities, palisades, walls, trenches, and every kind of defense. All these are made with hands and involve expense as well. But there is one safeguard which all sensible men possess by nature, a safeguard which is a valuable protection to all, but above all to a democracy against a tyrant. And what is this? It is distrust. Guard this possession and cleave to it. Preserve this, and you need never fear disaster. What is it that you desire, I said? Is it freedom? And do you not see that the very titles that Philip bears are utterly alien to freedom? 
For a king, a tyrant, is always the foe of freedom and the enemy of law. Will you not be on your guard, I said, lest in striving to be rid of war you find yourselves slaves? My audience heard these words and received them with a tumult of approbation, as well as many other speeches from the envoys, both when I was present and again later. And yet, it seems, there is still no better prospect of their keeping Philip's friendship and promises at a distance. In fact, the extraordinary thing is not that Messenians and certain Peloponnesians should act against their own better judgment, but that you, who understand for yourselves and who hear us, your orators, telling you that there is a design against you and that the toils are closing round you, that you, I say, by always refusing to act at once, should be about to find, as I think you will, that you have exposed yourselves unawares to the utmost peril. So much more does the pleasure and ease of the moment weigh with you than any advantage to be reaped at some future date. In regard to the practical measures which you must take, you will, if you are wise, deliberate by yourselves later. But I will at once propose an answer which you may make today and which it will be consistent with your duty to have adopted. The answer is read. Now the right course, men of Athens, was to have summoned before you those who conveyed the promises on the strength of which you were induced to make the peace. For I could never have brought myself to serve on the embassy, nor, I am sure, would you have discontinued the war, had you imagined that Philip, when he had obtained peace, would act as he has acted. What we were then told was something very different from this. And there are others, too, whom you should summon. You ask whom I mean? After the peace had been made, and I had returned from the second embassy, which was sent to administer the oaths, I saw how the city was being hoodwinked, and I spoke out repeatedly, protesting and forbidding you to sacrifice Thermopylae and Nephosians. And the men to whom I refer were those who then said that a water drinker like myself was naturally a fractious and ill-tempered fellow, while Philip, if only he crossed the pass, would fulfill your fondest prayers, for he would fortify Thespiae and Plataea. He would put an end to the insolence of the Thebans. He would cut a canal through the Chersonese at his own charges, and would repay you for Amphipolis by the restoration of Euboa and Oropus. All this was said from this very platform, and I am quite sure that you remember it well, though your memory of those who injure you is but short. To crown your disgrace, with nothing but these hopes in view, you resolved that this same peace should hold good for your posterity also, so completely had you fallen under their influence. But why do I speak of all this now? Why do I bid you summon these men? By heaven, I will tell the truth without reserve and will hold nothing back. My object is not to give way to abuse and so secure myself as good a hearing as others in this place, while giving those who have come into collision with me from the first an opportunity for a further claim upon Philip's money. Nor do I wish to waste time in empty words. No, but I think that the plan which Philip is pursuing will some day trouble you more than the present situation does. For his design is moving towards fulfillment, and though I shrink from precise conjecture, I fear its accomplishment may even now be only too close at hand. And when the time comes when you can no longer refuse to attend to what is passing, when you no longer hear from me or from some other that it is all directed against you, but all alike see it for yourselves and know it for a certainty, then I think you will be angry and harsh enough. And I am afraid that because your envoys have withheld from you the guilty secret of the purposes which they have been bribed to forward, those who are trying to remedy in some degree the ruin of which these men have been the instruments will fall victims to your wrath. For I observe that it is the general practice of some persons to vent their anger, not upon the guilty, but upon those who are most within their grasp. While then the trouble is still to come, still in process of growth, while we can still listen to one another's words, I would remind each of you once more of what he well knows, who it was that induced you to sacrifice the Phocians and Thermopylae, the control of which gave Philip command of the road to Attica and the Peloponnesus, who it was, I say, that converted your debate about your rights and your interests abroad into a debate about the safety of your own country and about war on your own borders, a war which will bring distress to each of us personally when it is at our doors, 
but which sprang into existence on that day. Had you not been misled by them, no trouble would have befallen this country. For we cannot imagine that Philip would have won victories by sea which would have enabled him to approach Attica with his fleet, or would have marched by land past Thermopylae and the Phocians. But he would either have been acting straightforwardly, keeping the peace and remaining quiet, or else he would have found himself instantly plunged into a war no less severe than that which originally made him desirous of the peace. What I have said is sufficient by way of reminder to you. Heaven grant that the time may not come when the truth of my words will be tested with all severity, for I at least have no desire to see anyone meet with punishment. However much he may deserve his doom, if it is accompanied by danger and calamity to us all. End of section 9. Section 10 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Embassy. Oration 19. Introduction. The principal events with which a reader of this speech ought to be acquainted have already been narrated. See especially the introduction to the last two speeches. The influence of the anti-Macedonian party grew gradually from the time of the peace onwards. In 346, within a month after the return of the second embassy, the ambassadors presented their reports before the logisty or board of auditors. After a futile attempt on the part of Aeschines to avoid making a report altogether, and Timarchus, supported by Demosthenes, there announced his intention of taking proceedings against Aeschines for misconduct on the second embassy. But Timarchus's own past history was not above reproach. He was attacked by Aeschines for the immoralities of his youth, which, it was stated, disqualified him from acting as prosecutor and, though defended by Demosthenes, was condemned and disfranchised. 345 BC. But early in 343, Hipparides impeached Philocrates for corruption as ambassador and obtained his condemnation to death, a penalty which he escaped by voluntary exile before the conclusion of the trial and later in the same year, Demosthenes brought the same charge against Aeschines. In the meantime, since the delivery of Demosthenes's second Philippic, Philip had been making fresh progress. The Arcadians and Argives, for the Athenian envoys to the Peloponnese in 344 seem to have had little success, were ready to open their gates to him. His supporters in Elis massacred their opponents, and with them the remnants of the Phocians who had crossed over to Elis with Phalaeus. At Megara, Perilus and Pteodorus almost succeeded in bringing a force of Philip's mercenaries into the town, but the attempt was defeated by the aid of an Athenian force under Phocion. In Euboea, Philip's troops occupied Porthmus, where the democratic party of Eretria had taken refuge, owing to an overthrow of the constitution brought about by Philip's intrigues, which resulted in the establishment of Clitarchus as tyrant. In the course of the same year, 343, occurred two significant trials. The first was that of Antiphon, who had made an offer to Philip to burn the Athenian dockyards at the Piraeus. He was summarily arrested by order of Demosthenes, probably in virtue of some administrative office, Aeschines obtained his release, but he was rearrested by order of the Council of Areopagus and condemned to death. The other trial was held before the Amphictyonic Council, and the motion of the people of Delos to decide whether the Athenians should continue to possess the right of managing the Temple of Delos. The assembly chose Aeschines as council for Athens, but the council of Areopagus, which had been given power to revise the appointment, put Hipparades in his place. Hipparades won the case. 
Early in 343, or at all events before the middle of the year, Philip sent Python of Byzantium to complain of the language used about him by Athenian orators, and to offer to revise and amend the terms of the peace of Philocrates. In response, an embassy was sent, headed by Hegesippus, a violent opponent of Macedonia, to propose to Philip, one, that instead of the clause that each party shall retain possession of what they have, a clause that each party shall possess what is their own should be substituted, and two, that all Greek states not included in the treaty of peace should be declared free, and that Athens and Philip should assist them if they were attacked. These proposals, if sanctioned, would obviously have reopened the question of Amphipolis, Pydna, and Potidaea, as well as of Cardia and the Thracian towns taken by Philip in 346. Hegesippus, moreover, was personally objectionable, and the embassy was dismissed with little courtesy by Philip, who even banished from Macedonia the Athenian poet Xenoclides for acting as host to the envoys. The feeling against Philip in Athens was evidently strong when the prosecution of Eschines by Demosthenes took place. The trial was held before a jury, probably consisting of 1,501 persons, presided over by the board of auditors. Demosthenes spoke first, and Eschines replied in a speech which is preserved. There is no doubt, on a comparison of the two speeches, that each, before it was published, received alterations and insertions, intended to meet the adversary's points, or to give a better colour to passages which had been unfavourably received. Probably not all the refutations in advance were such in reality, but there is no sufficient reason to doubt that the speeches were delivered substantially as we have them. Eschines was acquitted by thirty votes. The question of the guilt or innocence of Eschines will probably never be finally settled. A great part of his conduct can be explained as a sincere attempt to carry out the policy of Eubulus, or as the issue of a genuine belief that it was best for Athens to make terms with Philip and stand on his side. Even so, the wisdom and the veracity of certain speeches which he had made is open to grave question. But this is a different thing from corruption. Moreover, to some of Demosthenes's arguments, he has a conclusive reply. It is more difficult to explain his apparent change of opinion between the 18th and 19th of Elaphebolion, 346, if Demosthenes's report of the debates is to be trusted, and some writers are disposed to date his corruption from the intervening night. Nor is it easy to meet Demosthenes' argument that if Eschines had really been taken in by Philip and believed the promises which he announced, or if he had actually heard Philip make the promises, he would have regarded Philip afterwards as a personal enemy and not as a friend. But even on these points Eschines might reply, though he could not reply so to the Athenian people or jury, that though he did not trust the promises, he regarded the interest of Athens as so closely bound up with the alliance with Philip, that he considered it justifiable to deceive the people into making the alliance, or at least to take the risk of the promises which he announced proving untrue. In any case, there is no convincing evidence of corruption, and it may be taken as practically certain that he was not bribed to perform particular services. It is less certain that he was not influenced by generous presence from Philip in forming his judgment of Philip's character and intentions. The standard of Athenian public opinion in regard to the receipt of presents was not that of the English civil service, and the ancient orators accuse one another of corruption almost as a matter of course. We have seen that Demosthenes began the attack upon Eubulus's party in this form as early as the speech of the Rhodians. It appears in almost every subsequent oration, and in their turn his opponents make the same charge against him. 
It is, in any case, remarkable that at a time when the people was plainly exasperated with the peace and its authors, and very ill-disposed towards Philip, a popular jury nevertheless acquitted Eskines, and the verdict is not sufficiently explained either by the fact that Eubulus supported Eskines or by the juror's memory of Demosthenes' own part in the earliest peace negotiations, though this must have weakened the force of his attack. That Demosthenes himself believed Eskines to have been bribed, and could himself see no other explanation of his conduct, need not be doubted and although the speech contains some of those misrepresentations of fact and passages of irrelevant personal abuse which deface some of his best work it also contains some of his finest pieces of oratory and narrative the second part of the speech is more broken up into short sections and less clearly arranged than the first Earlier arguments are repeated, and a few passages may be due, at least in their present shape, to revision after the trial. But the latter part, even as it stands, is successful in leaving the points of greatest importance strongly impressed upon the mind. The following analysis of the speech may enable the reader to find his way through it without serious difficulty. Introduction, paragraphs 1 to 28. Section 1, Exordium, paragraphs 1, 2. Impartiality requested of the jury in view of Eskines's attempt to escape by indirect means. Section 2, Points of the Trial, paragraphs 3 to 8. An ambassador must 1. Give true reports, 2. Give good advice, 3 obey his instructions, 4. Not lose time, 5. Be incorruptible. Section 3. Preliminary Exposition of the Arguments. Paragraphs 9 to 28. 1. The previous anti-Macedonian zeal of Eskines suddenly collapsed after the first embassy. 2. In the deliberations on the peace, Eskines supported Philocrates. 3. After the second embassy, Eskines prevented Athens from guarding Thermopylae and saving the Phocians by false reports and promises. 4. Such a change of policy is only explicable by corruption. Part 1. Paragraphs 29 to 178. The five points of introduction, section 2, are treated as three or in three groups. Group 1. The reports made by Eskines on his return from the second embassy and his advice especially as to the ruin of the Phocians. Paragraphs 29 to 97. 1. The reports A. To the Senate B. To the people and their reception. Paragraphs 29 to 46. 2. Evidence that Eskines conspired with Philip against the Phocians whose ruin is described. Paragraphs 47 to 71. 3. Refutation of three anticipated objections, beginning at paragraph 72, paragraph 78, paragraph 80, respectively. Paragraphs 72 to 82. 4. The danger to Athens from Eskines' treachery. Paragraphs 83 to 7. 5. Request to confine the trial strictly to relevant points, paragraphs 88 to 97. Group 2. The corruption of Eskines by the bribes of Philip, paragraphs 98 to 149. 1. Arguments, beginning paragraph 102, paragraph 111, paragraph 114, paragraph 116, showing the corruption of Eskines, paragraphs 98 to 119. 2. Refutation of anticipated objections, beginning at paragraph 120, paragraph 134, paragraph 147. Paragraphs 120 to 49. Group 3. Eskines's loss of time, by which Philip profited, and disobedience to his instructions. Paragraphs 150 to 77. 1. Narrative of the Second Embassy. 
paragraphs 150 to 62. 2. Comparison of the two embassies. Paragraphs 163 to 5. 3. Comparison of Demosthenes' own conduct with that of the other ambassadors. Paragraphs 167 to 77. Recapitulation of the points established. Paragraphs 177, 178. Part 2. Paragraphs 179 to 343. Section 1. The injury done to Athens. A. By the loss of Thrace and the Hellespont. B. Generally by false reports from ambassadors. Paragraphs 179 to 86. Section 2. Refutation of anticipated objections. A. It is not Philip's fault that he has not satisfied Athens. Paragraph 187. B. Demosthenes has no right to prosecute. Paragraphs 188 to 220, including a digression, paragraphs 192 to 200, on Aeschines's character and incidents in his life. Section 3. Demosthenes' object in prosecuting, passing into reproof of the laxity of Athens towards traitors. Paragraphs 221 to 33. Section 4. Warning against any attempt by Aeschines to confuse the dates and incidents of the two embassies. Paragraphs 234 to 6. Section 5. Criticism of Aeschines' brothers and his prosecution of Timarchus. Paragraphs 237 to 58. Section 6. The increasing danger from traitors and the traditional attitude of Athens towards them. Paragraphs 259 to 87. Section 7. Attack upon Eubulus for defending Aeschines. Paragraphs 288 to 99. Section 8. Philip's policy and methods. Proofs of Aeschines' complicity repeated. Paragraphs 300 to 31. Section 9. Warnings to the jury against Aeschines' attempts to mislead them. And conclusion. Paragraphs 331 to 43. End of section 10. Section 11 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Embassy, Part 1. How much interest this case has excited, men of Athens, and how much canvassing has taken place must, I feel sure, have become fairly evident to you all, after the persistent overtures just now made to you, while you were drawing your lots. Yet I will make the request of you all, a request which ought to be granted even when unasked, that you will not allow the favour or the person of any man to weigh more with you than justice and the oath which each of you swore before he entered the court. Remember that what I ask is for your own welfare and for that of the whole state, while the entreaties and the eager interest of the supporters of the accused have for their aim the selfish advantage of individuals, and it is not to confirm criminals in the possession of such advantages that the laws have called you together, but to prevent their attainment of them. Now I observe that while all who enter upon public life in an honest spirit profess themselves under a perpetual responsibility, even when they have passed their formal examination, the defended Eskines does the very reverse. For before entering your presence to give an account of his actions, he has put out of the way one of those who appeared against him at his examination, and others he pursues with threats, thus introducing into public life a practice which is of all the most atrocious and most contrary to your interests. For if one who has transacted and managed any public business is to render himself secure against accusation by spreading terror around him, rather than by the justice of his case, your supremacy must pass entirely out of your hands. I have every confidence and belief that I shall prove the defendant guilty of many atrocious crimes, 
for which he deserves the extreme penalty of the law. But I will tell you frankly of the fear which troubles me in spite of this confidence. It seems to me, men of Athens, that the issue of every trial before you is determined as much by the occasion as by the fact. And I am afraid that the length of time which has elapsed since the embassy may have caused you to forget the crimes of Eschines, or to be too familiar with them. I will tell you therefore how, in spite of this, you may yet, as I believe, arrive at a just decision and give a true verdict today. You have, gentlemen of the jury, to inquire and to consider what are the points on which it is proper to demand an account from an ambassador. He is responsible first for his report, secondly, for what he has persuaded you to do, thirdly, for his execution of your instructions, next for dates, and besides all these things, for the integrity or venality of his conduct throughout. And why is he responsible in these respects? Because on his report must depend your discussion of the situation. If his report is true, your decision is a right one. If otherwise, it is the reverse. Again, you regard the councils of ambassadors as especially trustworthy. You listen to them in the belief that they have personal knowledge of the matter with which they were sent to deal. Never, therefore, ought an ambassador to be convicted of having given you any worthless or pernicious advice. Again, it is obviously proper that he should have carried out your instructions to him with regard to both speech and action, and your express resolutions as to his conduct. Very good. But why is he responsible for dates? Because, men of Athens, it often happens that the opportunity upon which much that is of great importance depends lasts but for a moment, and if this opportunity is deliberately and treacherously surrendered to the enemy, no subsequent steps can possibly recover it. But as to the integrity or corruption of an ambassador, you would all, I am sure, admit that to make money out of proceedings that injure the city is an atrocious thing and deserves your heavy indignation. Yet the implied distinction was not recognized by the framer of our law. He absolutely forbade all taking of presents, thinking, I believe, that a man who has once received presents and been corrupted with money no longer remains even a safe judge of what is to the interest of the city. If then I can convict the defendant Eskinis by conclusive proofs of having made a report that was utterly untrue and prevented the people from hearing the truth from me, if I prove that he gave advice that was entirely contrary to your interests, that on his mission he fulfilled none of your instructions to him, that he wasted time during which opportunities for accomplishing much that was of great importance were sacrificed and lost to the city, and that he received presents in payment for all these services in company with Philocrates, then condemn him and exact the penalty which his crimes deserve. If I fail to prove these points, or fail to prove them all, then regard me with contempt and let the defendant go. I have still to charge him, men of Athens, with many atrocious acts in addition to these, acts which would naturally call forth the execration of every one among you. But I desire, before all else that I am about to say, to remind you, though most of you I know remember it well, of the position which Eskinis originally took up in public life, and the speeches which he thought it right to address to the people against Philip, for I would have you realize that his own actions, his own speeches at the beginning of his career, are the strongest evidence of his corruption. According to his own public declaration at that time, he was the first Athenian to perceive that Philip had designs against the Hellenes, and was corrupting certain leading men in Arcadia. With Iskander, the son of Neoptolemus, to second him in his performance, he came before the council, and he came before the people, to speak on the subject. He persuaded you to send envoys in all directions to bring together a congress at Athens to discuss the question of war with Philip. Then, on his return from Arcadia, he reported to you those noble and lengthy speeches which, he said, he had delivered on your behalf before the ten thousand at Megalopolis. 
in reply to Philip's spokesman, Hieronymus, and he described at length the criminal wrong that was done, not only to their own several countries, but to all Hellas, by men who took bribes and received money from Philip. Such was his policy at that time, and such the sample which he displayed of his sentiments. Then you were induced by Aristodemus, Neoptolemus, Ctesiphon, and the rest of those who brought reports from Macedonia, in which there was not an honest word, to send ambassadors to Philip and to negotiate for peace. Eschines himself is appointed one of them, in the belief, not that he was one of those who would sell your interests, or had placed confidence in Philip, but rather one who would keep an eye on the rest. The speeches which he had already delivered, and his antipathy to Philip, naturally led you to take this view of him. Well, after this, he came to me, and tried to make an agreement by which we should act in concert on the embassy, and urged strongly that we should both keep an eye upon that abominable and shameless man, Philocrates. And until we returned to Athens from the first embassy, I, at least, men of Athens, had no idea that he had been corrupted and had sold himself. For, not to mention the other speeches which, as I have told you, he had made on former occasions, at the first of the assemblies in which he debated about the peace, he rose and delivered an exordium, which I think I can repeat to you word for word as he uttered it at the meeting. If Philocrates, he said, had spent a very long time in studying how he could best oppose the peace, I do not think he could have found a better device than a motion of this kind. The peace which he proposes is one which I can never recommend the city to make, so long as a single Athenian remains alive. Peace, however, we ought a thing to make and he made a brief and reasonable speech in the same tone. But though he had spoken thus at the first meeting, in the hearing of you all, yet at the second meeting, when the peace was to be ratified, when I was upholding the resolution of the Allies, and working for a peace on just and equitable terms, when you, in your desire for such a peace, would not even listen to the voice of the despicable Philocrates, then, I say, Eschines rose and spoke in support of him, using language for which he deserves, God knows, to die many deaths, saying that you must not remember your forefathers, nor tolerate speakers who recalled your trophies and your victories by sea, and that he would frame and propose a law that you should assist no Helene who had not previously assisted you. These words he had the callous shamelessness to utter in the very presence and hearing of the ambassadors whom you had summoned from the Hellenic states in pursuance of the advice which he himself had given you before he had sold himself. You elected him again, men of Athens, to receive the oaths. How he frittered away the time, how cruelly he injured all his country's interests, and what violent mutual enmity arose between myself and him in consequence of his conduct and of my desire to prevent it, you shall hear presently. But when we returned from this embassy, which was sent to receive the oaths, and the report of which is now under examination, when we had secured nothing, either small or great, of all that had been promised and expected when you were making the peace, but had been totally deceived, when they had again acted without regard to their instructions, and had conducted their mission in direct defiance of your decree, we came before the council, and there are many who have personal knowledge of what I am about to tell you, for the council chamber was crowded with spectators. Well, I came forward and reported to the council the whole truth. I denounced these men. I recounted the whole story, beginning with those first hopes aroused in you by the report of Ctesiphon and Aristodemus, and going on to the speeches which Eschines delivered during the time of the peace negotiations, and the position into which they had brought the city. As regards all that remained to you, I meant the Phocians and Thermopylae, I counselled you not to abandon these, not to be victims once more of the same mistake, not to let yourselves be reduced to extremities through depending upon a succession of hopes and promises, and I carried the counsel with me.
but when the day of the assembly came and it was our duty to address you the defendant Eschines, came forward before any of his colleagues and i entreat you in god's name to follow me and try to recollect whether what i tell you is true for now we have come to the very thing which so cruelly injured and ruined your whole cause he made not the remotest attempt to give any report of the results of the embassy if indeed he questioned the truth of my allegations at all but instead of this he made statements of such a character promising you benefits so numerous and so magnificent that he completely carried you away with him for he said that before his return he had persuaded philip upon all the points in which the interests of the city were involved in regard both to the amphictyonic dispute and to all other matters and he described to you a long speech which he professed to have addressed to philip against the thebans and of which he reported to you the substance calculating that as the result of his own diplomacy you would within two or three days without stirring from home or taking the field or suffering any inconvenience hear that thebes was being blockaded alone and isolated from the rest of boeotia that thespiae and platae were being repeopled and that the debt due to the god was being exacted not from the phocians but from the thebans who had planned the seizure of the temple for he said that he gave philip to understand that those who planned the act were no less guilty of impiety than those whose hands executed the plan and that on this account the thebans had set a price upon his head moreover he said that he heard some of the eubians who had been thrown into a state of panic and confusion by the friendly relations established between athens and philip saying to the ambassadors you have not succeeded gentlemen in concealing from us the conditions on which you have made your peace with philip nor are we unaware that while you have given him amphipolis he has undertaken to hand over euboea to you there was indeed another matter which he had arranged as well but he did not wish to mention this at present since even as it was some of his colleagues were jealous of him this was an enigmatic and indirect allusion to oropus these utterances naturally raised him high in your estimation he seemed to be an admirable speaker and a marvellous man and he stepped down with a very lofty air then i rose and denied all knowledge of these things and at the same time attempted to repeat some part of my report to the council but they now took their stand by me one on this side one on that the defendant and philocrates they shouted they interrupted me and finally they jeered while you laughed you would not hear and you did not wish to believe anything but what eschines had reported heaven knows your feelings were natural enough for who that expected all these marvellous benefits would have tolerated a speaker who said that the expectation would not be realized or denounced the proceedings of those who made the promise all else of course was of secondary importance at the time in comparison with the expectations and the hopes placed before you any contradiction appears to be nothing but sheer obstruction and malignity while the proceedings described seemed to be of incredible importance and advantage to the city now with what object have i recalled these occurrences to you before everything else and described these speeches of his my first and chief object men of athens is that none of you when he hears me speak of any of the things that were done and is struck by their unparalleled atrocity may ask in surprise why i did not tell you at once and inform you of the facts but may remember the promises which these men made at each critical moment and by which they entirely prevented everyone else from obtaining a hearing and that splendid pronouncement by eschines and that you may realize that in addition to all his other crimes you have suffered this further wrong at his hands that you were prevented from learning the truth instantly when you ought to have learned it because you were deluded by hopes deceits and promises that is my first and as i have said my chief object in recalling all these occurrences but there is a second which is of no less importance than the first and what is this it is that you may remember the policy which he adopted in his public life when he was still uncorrupted 
his guarded and mistrustful attitude toward philip and may consider the sudden growth of confidence and friendship which followed and then if all that he announced to you has been realized if the results achieved are satisfactory you may believe that all has been done out of an honest interest in the welfare of athens but if on the other hand the issue has been exactly the opposite of that which he predicted if his policy has involved the city in great disgrace and in grave perils you may then be sure that his conversion was due to his own base covetousness and to his having sold the truth for money end of section eleven section twelve of the public orations of demosthenes this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Embassy, Part 2. And now, since I have been led on to this subject, I desire to describe to you, before everything else, the way in which they took the Phocian question entirely out of your hands. And let none of you, gentlemen of the jury, when he looks at the magnitude of the transactions, imagine that the crimes with which the defendant is charged are on a grander scale than one of his reputation could compass. You have rather to observe that any one whom you would have placed in such a position as this, a position in which, as each critical moment arrived, the decision would be in his hands, could have brought about disasters equal to those for which Eschines is responsible, if, like Eschines, he had wished to sell his services and to cheat and deceive you. For, however contemptible may be the men whom you frequently employ in the public service, it does not follow that the part which the world expects this city to play is a contemptible one. Far from it. And further, though it was Philip, of course, who destroyed the Phocan people, it was Eschines and his party who seconded Philip's efforts. And so, what you have to observe and consider is whether, so far as the preservation of the Phocans came within the scope of their mission, these men deliberately destroyed and ruined that whole cause. You have not to suppose that Eschines ruined the Phocans by himself. How could he have done so? To the clerk. Now give me the draft resolution which the council passed in view of my report, and the deposition of the clerk who wrote it. To the jury. For I would have you know that I am not repudiating today transactions about which I held my peace at the time, but that I denounced them at once, with full provision of what must follow, and that the council, which was not prevented from hearing the truth from me, neither voted thanks to the ambassadors, nor thought fit to invite them to the town hall. From the foundation of the city to this day, no body of ambassadors is recorded to have been treated so, nor even Timagoras, whom the people condemned to death. But these men have been so treated. To the clerk. First read them the deposition, and then the resolution. The deposition and resolutions are read. Here is no expression of thanks, no invitation of the ambassadors to the town hall by the council. If Eschines asserts that there is any, let him point it out and produce it, and I give way to him. But there is none. Now, on the assumption that we all fulfilled our mission in the same way, the council had good reason not to thank any of us, for the transaction of all alike were, in that case, atrocious but if some of us acted uprightly while others did the reverse it must it seems have been owing to the knavery of their colleagues that the virtues were forced to take their share of this dishonour how then can you all ascertain without any difficulty who is the rogue recall to your minds who it is that has denounced the transaction from the outset for it is plain that it must have been the guilty person who was well content to be silent, to stave off the day of reckoning for the moment, and to take care for the future not to present himself to give an account of his actions. 
while it must have been he whose conscience was clear to whom there occurred the thought of the danger lest through keeping silence he might be regarded as a partner in such atrocious villainy now it is i that have denounced these men from the outset while none of them has accused me such then was the resolution of the council the meeting of the assembly took place when philip was already at thermopylae for this was the first of all their crimes that they placed philip in command of the situation so that when you ought first to have heard the facts then to have deliberated and afterwards to have taken such measures as you had resolved upon you in fact heard nothing until he was on the spot and it was no longer easy to say what steps you ought to take in addition to this no one read the resolution of the council to the people and the people never heard it but Aeschines rose and delivered the harangue which i just now described to you recounting the numerous and important benefits which he said he had before his return persuaded philip to grant and on account of which the thebans had set a price upon his head in consequence of these appalled though you were at first at the proximity of philip and angry with these men for not having warned you of it you became as mild as possible having now formed the expectation that all your wishes would be realized and you would not hear a word from me or from any one else after this was read the letter from philip which Eschines had written when we had left him behind a letter which was nothing less than a direct and express defence in writing of the misconduct of the ambassadors for in it is stated that philip himself prevented them when they were anxious to go to the several cities and receive the oaths and that he retained them in order that they might help him to effect a reconciliation between the peoples of hallos and pharsalus he takes upon his own shoulders the whole of their misconduct and makes it his own but as to the phocians and thespiae and the promises contained in Eschines's report to you why there is not the slightest mention of them and it was no mere accident that the proceedings took this form for the failure of the ambassadors to carry out or give effect to any of the instructions imposed upon them by your resolution the failure for which you were bound to punish them philip makes himself responsible in their stead and says that the fault was his for you were not likely of course to be able to punish him but the points in regard to which philip wished to deceive you and to steal a march upon the city were made the subject of the defendant's report in order that you might be able to find no ground of accusation or reproach against philip since these points were not mentioned either in his letter or in any other part of the communications received from him but to the clerk read the jury the actual letter written by Eschines, sent by philip and to the jury do you observe that it is such as i have described to the clerk read on the letter is read you hear the letter men of athens you hear how noble and generous it is but about the phocians or the thebans or the other subjects of the defendant's report not a syllable indeed in this letter there is not an honest word as you will very shortly see for yourselves he says that he retained the ambassadors to help him reconcile the people of hallos and such is the reconciliation that they have obtained that they are exiles from their country and their city is laid waste and as to the prisoners though he professed to be wondering what he could do to gratify you he says that the idea of procuring their release had not occurred to any one but evidence has as you know been laid before you many times in the assembly to the effect that i myself went to ransom them taking a talent for the purpose and it shall now be laid before you once more it follows therefore that it was to deprive me of my laudable ambition that Eschines persuaded philip to insert this statement but the strongest point of all is this in his former letter the letter which we brought back he wrote quote, i should have mentioned expressly the great benefits that i propose to confer upon you if i felt sure that you would grant me the alliance as well 
end quote. And yet, when the alliance has been granted, he says that he does not know what he can do to gratify you. He does not even know what he had himself promised. Why, he must obviously have known that, unless he was trying to cheat you. To prove that he did write thus, and in these terms, to the clerk, take his former letter and read the very passage beginning at this point. Read on. An extract from the letter is read. Thus, before he obtained the peace, he undertook to set down in writing the great benefits he would confer on the city in the event of an alliance also being granted him. But as soon as he had obtained both his wishes, he says that he does not know what he can do to gratify you, but that if you will inform him, he will do anything that will not involve any disgrace or stigma upon himself. Such are the excuses in which he takes refuge to secure his retreat in case you should actually make any suggestion or should be induced to ask any favour. It would have been possible to expose this whole proceeding at the time, and a great deal more, without delay, to inform you of the facts and to prevent you from sacrificing your cause, had not the thought of Thespia and Plate and the idea that the Thebans were on the very point of paying the penalty robbed you of the truth. While, however, there was good reason for mentioning these prospects, if the city was to hear of them and then be cheated, it would have been better, if their realization was actually intended, that nothing should have been said about them. For if matters had already reached a stage at which the Thebans would be no better off, even if they received the design against them, why was the design not fulfilled? But if its fulfillment was prevented because they received it in time, who was it that betrayed the secret? Must it not have been Eskines? Its fulfillment, however, was not in fact intended, nor did the defendant either desire or expect it, so that he may be relieved of the charge of betraying the secret. What was intended was that you should be hoodwinked by these statements, and should refuse to hear the truth from me, that you should not stir from home, and that such a decree should carry the day as would involve the destruction of the Phocians. Hence this prodigality in promises and their proclamation in his speech to the people. When I heard Eskines making all these magnificent promises, I knew perfectly well that he was lying and I will tell you how I knew. I knew it first because when Philip was about to take the oath in ratification of the peace, the Phocians were openly excluded from it. This was a point which it would have been natural to pass over in silence if the Phocians were really to be saved. And secondly, I knew it because the promises were not made by Philip's ambassadors or in Philip's letter, but by the defendant. Accordingly, drawing my conclusions from these facts, I rose and came forward and attempted to contradict him. But as you were not willing to hear me, I held my peace with no more than these words of solemn protest, which I entreat you in heaven's name to remember. I have no knowledge of these promises, I said, and no share in making them, and I added, I do not believe they will be fulfilled. This last expression roused your temper, and I proceeded, Take care, men of Athens, that if any of these things comes to pass, you thank these gentlemen for it, and give your honours and crowns to them, and not to me. If, however, anything of an opposite character occurs, you must equally vent your anger on them. I decline all responsibility. No, no, interrupted Eskines. Do not decline responsibility now. Take care, rather, that you do not claim credit when the time comes. Indeed, it would be an injustice if I did so, I replied. Then Philocrates arose with a most insolent air and said, It is no wonder, men of Athens, that I and Demosthenes should disagree, for he drinks water, I drink wine. And you laughed. End of section 12